right? <laughs> I just want to say sorry so much for all the crappy audio lately. Like, I knew slowly, like, my audio is getting bad, but I didn't realize it would get that bad that fast. I mean, I only recorded, like, five things. But, um, and it may still be this bad because I'm still using this webcam. I'm just not going to record, like, the long-winded things. And on the other channel, Libra Ararita and Amrita, I read those like months ago, like a month ago. So they still sound like shit, but, um, sorry. It's just, you know, use what you can work with, I guess, you know, and I can't find my freaking recording, like microphone cable or whatever. Those things aren't easy to get a good one. So, um, and I stay home and don't go anywhere. So I can't like, I mean, I can get one. I just, I don't know. I'm going to try to, use other things for now. Um, cause like I said, like I have a mixing board, but it says not to keep it plugged in. And if you leave it out, it gets dust and all the little cracks. And like, I don't know. I need to figure out a better setup and all that, but hopefully this will work for now. I'm trying to just get this stuff out of the way. Uh, so I can move on and do other like stuff, but you know, it's just the way things are. You gotta, work through drudgery um which i mean some of this is drudgery but i'm trying to just remember a lot of this stuff um and add to it so i said in dying daily with reguli january 6th 2016 and scrolling through it i already know this was based somewhat on like this conversation i had with a friend um and it was like very revelatory especially about this number 548 which is like a strange one of those like off numbers you wouldn't expect to have much insight and uh i realized a lot of things about that mainly from studying this and reading it contemplating it which i'm not going to read it again because here it is but uh it's essentially crowley's reformulation of he calls it the mark of the beast but it's you know um, it's just sort of like, a. it's sort of like a thelemic pentagram ritual in a sense, but amped up a little. And, um, the final gesture is important. So anyway, Liber V. Vel Reguli, or Book 5 of The King, is the energy ritual used for generating and releasing the energies of the active aspect of Horus, Ra Hur Kui. The title has a value of 548, and corresponds further with a beast ritual of the king, or hidden, since a beast is hidden, uh, the key of the king's ritual, ritual of 6 cubed, or 6 times 6 times 6, the mark of the beast plus XV, or 15, the devil, etc. 548 is also Sana Vedayita Nirodha, or Attainment of Extinction, a form of the Nirodha Samapati mentioned by Crowley back in Liber B. Vel Magi, verse 18, which signifies the cessation of perception and feeling, which is to be strived for during deep meditation before or after a ritual of this magnitude. This state of purity is not to be achieved through an energetic ritual such as this, but the connection is noted because being a function of the Sahasrara, or 19 plus 529, 23 times 23, or crown chakra, which is associated with the union between Nuit and Hadit, conferring the magical powers of manifestation, Maya or Mayan. Merrily, 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 life is but a dream. 548 is a straight path to God. The formulation and extension of the will being itself a monument and sacrament that enables the mage to attune his physical self to his higher genius, which can be called God. The magical word Alalia, given by Frater Akkad, recently came up in an AA meeting, and it was realized that meaning speechless, wordless, and unspeakable, and deriving from Alala, God is not not, essentially conveys the resonant phrase, there is no God but man, Liber Oz, which means man is God, at least in a mystical sense, 
and as close to God as you will ever get while physically incarnate, being self-conscious, self-willed, and self-directed, as well as being the terrestrial vessel which has the capacity to contemplate and express its will in and of the universe. Subject, I, and object, things, are actually one. The I is just another thing. What is beyond thingness is in fact a movement, a pure energy which is will and action, the ever-changing link between the two being symbolized by the pillar of the I itself. And it kind of gives more connection to the Hebrew God name of Asiah and Tifereth, or Tifereth and Asiah, Yehovah Alua Badath, in Psalms 146.2, while I live, will I praise the Lord. I will sing praises unto my God while I have any being. Verse 548 is also tw the 29th verse of that chapter in uh, Liber Akbish, and it says, You found the stellar load. The stellar load being essentially that cosmic substance of the soul. 548 is also the unconditioned absolute and the absolute without qualities. So, essentially, the unconditioned absolute. Going back to the Sahasrara, uh, the vital principle, the higher mental plane, and thinking. So, essentially, it's very airy. And also, the black flame. The black flame, perhaps, probably even more apt. Um, the unspeakable is the intention and vibration in which the will is expressed. And though every act is a magical act, and all things a form of yoga, the whole of the law is do what thou wilt, and only the true will is one and the same with the unspeakable God or totality of all. Thus, the I is the straight path to God. It is in this sense, this is a formula of the mark of the beast, for it supposes that there is no need for an intermediary or intercessors, or arbitrators, or middleman between you and God. And if there is, then the slaves shall serve. Al chapter two verse fifty-eight. Lucifer is said to have fallen to his state as Satan, the adversary, for wanting to be the Most High, or like the Most High. Satan is said to be the ruler of this world, the earth and the air, i.e., terrestrial and cosmic earth and space, i.e., the material world. It is in this sense that the physical plane is a veritable hell. So again, Leviathan and swathing or encircling Malkuth, the body, etc. For all phenomena is sorrow. Jesus Christ said to be wise as the serpent, and that the kingdom of God is within, and that he too, as the Chrysos or spirit of gold, i.e. the sun, the light of the world, the way, the truth, and the life, God, the son of God, is within. The Antichrist refers to two different characterizations those who reject the light of Christ, and he who is rejected by the church, which itself is growing dimmer by the day. For placing himself above their false antichrist, which is the real embodiment of the true demonic devil, which indeed keeps man from knowing God. And so, where did I want to go with this? I um, actually wanted to bring up this post by... Tracy Twyman, not because it's necessarily related, but because it's forgotten, I think, and it came up in relation to this Marilyn Manson controversy from like 15 years ago uh, that's only just now, I guess, becoming, I mean, I don't know, trauma and abuse and stuff can take a while to even be like realized or recognized, but uh, at the same time, like, how can you read, like, how can you go about, I don't know, it's just weird. But, um, Tracy analyzes some of this stuff, like, a while ago. And it's funny, all this, like, I don't even want to say it, or I'll get a, uh, a little warning about cannibals below my video, but before, around 2016, 17, and all the 17 stuff started coming out, um... Some of this stuff all was already there. Like, goes it goes this whole era or issue goes back, um, possibly centuries, but definitely it was like the twenties, nineteen twenties, thirties. Um, 
So she called it Mad Love, Pedophile Hearts, Disposable Teens, and the Closing of the Doors of Mercy from November 29th, 2016. And she said, a few nights ago, Clyde Lewis, kindly honored by request, or my request, and did a show asking his audience if they felt that Google was reading their minds. I have been trying to explain to him and others how I feel that uh, working on my latest project has had the effect of tapping my consciousness into the current zeitgeist to such a point that there is no difference between me thinking about the possibility of something and it happening in the real world or being revealed. Almost at the same time, I think about it. Not too long ago, somebody, a Satanist, contacted me and told me that they were talking to Baphomet on the Ouija board around Halloween. This person claimed to be unfamiliar with my work before this instance. Baphomet insisted that he contact me and mentioned me by name. He went to bed that night and had a dream of someone kneeling before an unseen figure and play, uh, praying for mercy, uh, praying for mercy, over and over again. When he googled my name the next day, he saw a picture of me and realized that I was the person in his dream. Within an hour of receiving this message, I turned through bibliomancy to Genesis 18:16 through 23, where Abraham tries to convince the Lord not to destroy both the righteous and the wicked in the valley of Siddim because of their sexual abominations, extracting from the Lord a promise that if at least ten righteous men can be found there, he would spare all the place for their sakes. As we all know, though, the cities were destroyed after all. This got me thinking that perhaps the prophetic dream was meant to indicate that I was meant to play a similar role, and that it was my job for some reason to beg God to show mercy on us all despite our corruption. As it turns out, it has been the year of mercy in the liturgical calendar of the Catholic Church since last year's Feast of the Immaculate Conception on December 8th. In Latin, it's the Lubilium Misericordiae. Uh, this term illuminates the etymological connections between mercy and misery be, uh, via the concepts of empathy and pity. At the beginning of the year, churches all over the world held ceremonies opening the Porta Sancta, or Holy Door, with this dedication. That year is now drawing to a close, signaled by a bizarre closing of the Doors of Mercy ceremony at the Vatican yesterday. They also did a concert for the poor with Ennio Morricone. I already came across the symbol for the Year of Mercy a few weeks ago and saved a copy. I didn't know what it meant at the time. It is indeed a very peculiar image. Merciful like the Father, the Year of Mercy at the Cathedral. It shows like well, it's like Jesus carrying someone else, possibly another Jesus or something, or who knows, some, some poor guy, I don't know. Several other people have claimed publicly that they think the image promotes tra transgenderism, homosexuality, and Illuminism or Satanism. One man, uh, William Tapley, claims that for the sacrificial son figure on the back of the father is actually a woman with a beard. He says that the woman's beard is made in the shape of a heart, signifying sexual love between the man and the woman on his back. He also says that if you count up the number of whiskers on the beards of both figures, you'd get three uh, groups of six each. Perhaps, then, the image is meant to signify the recombining of Samael and Lilith, the two demons mentioned in the Zohar, who used to be one being, and who will annihilate existence if they are ever allowed to unite again in sexual union. The union of these two beings is called in the Zohar, the beast, and the other god. I ended up on Round Saturn Eye's channel after stumbling upon one of his videos. It discusses Miley Cyrus taking a backwards bent position and a scene of Linda Blair doing the same from the first Exorcist film. It reminds me very much of the Jeffrey Dahmer victim pose from Tony Podesta's Arch of Hysteria sculpture that I have discussed recently in this article and this article about The Exorcist 3. So she references the, these other ones, which I pulled up, but so I guess that's one of them. Dahmer Poe's statue in Tony Podesta's house matches illustration published uh, with Aleister Crowley text. Alright, so while that loads... Should I already 
you. Of course. So I've had these up too long. I need to reload the pictures. Um, hopefully they will. I theorized that the Egyptian Nuit night might be the same as the Jewish Lilith night and pointed out that Nuit was always shown as a naked woman bending over in the form of an arch, just as we see illustrated in the figure for the Year of Mercy, the Arch of Hysteria. Office Thotenos, 1903, Oil on Canvas by Sir Charles Bell, Scottish, 1774 to 1842. Royal College of Surgeons, Edinburgh. Miley Cyrus, Spider Walk from The Exorcist. In the same round Saturnized video, we see a scene from a Marilyn Manson video that shows a girl being swallowed by a long black plastic coiled tube. We see her head and arms dangling out one side. Then a pair of legs and feet emerge from the other side and attempt to walk. All of this is interesting to me as it reminds me of a theme that is found in several of the images of the alleged Knights Templar artifacts featured in the book Mysterium Baphometus Revelatum by Joseph von Hammer Pergstahl, Child Swallowed by Goblin from Mysterious Baphometus Revelatum, Boy Being Eaten by Dragon, This one shows a baby emerging from a baptism of fire. Child being immolated from Mysterium Baphometus Revelatum. As well, the queer way of contorting the body reminds me of this image of an idol, also from Mysterium. Just like we see illustrated in the Manson video, I think it is symbolic of entering the abyss, being baptized by wisdom, immersed in the cup of mind from the Corpus Hermeticum and dissolved into atoms, then re-emerging backwards from the other side. Now, if it hadn't been for Pizzagate, I would have never recognized the pedophile symbol on Marilyn Manson's wrist, the spiral heart. It's also, I mean, on the CD and all over, eat, it's the eat me, drink me symbol, so. On the website Knocked Cabaret, mentioned, um, maintained by Nick Kushner, which seems to be all about exploring the symbolism used by Marilyn Manson, there's an entry about what he calls the Eat Me, Drink Me heart. In 2007, Eat Me, Drink Me brought with it for the first time in nearly over 10 years, a symbol Manson adopted to represent himself with, uh, that, with that he did not have an immediate and apparent deeper connection or connotation to the occult, mock fascism, or an artistic movement. This logo, later dubbed the heart-shaped spiral, in official online store item descriptions, was minimalistically a roughly drawn heart which spiraled, uh, spiraled at its center. Manson revealed that it was for an homage to Evan Rachel Wood for inspiring him with love and creative drive, which was the impetus needed to create the album. He elaborated that as it was tattooed on his inner left or left inner wrist, if he was ever driven again to the depths of suicide, he was nearly in the throes of uh, prior to this. It would be an omnipresent reminder that he would have to break a heart in order to fatally sever an artery. Aside from the raw nature and purpose it symbolically serves, several similar representations exist which range from the logo of an ice cream, uh, ice cream company to the symbol of a pedophilic organization in support of relationships between a man and a young girl, which can in part be seen as a joke, even if coincidental uh, even if coincidental, given Manson's half-facetious Lolita references toward he and Evan's obvious age difference. Probably the most likely and closest connotation which fits the heart logo, as used by Manson, is that which illustrates the cover of the 1935 film Mad Love. As is seen via the cover art, which is the only appearance of the heart, not in the film itself, a very similar representation of the heart logo, and not only the heart itself, but also the placement atop the eye, uh, a la the artwork to Eat Me, Drink Me of Manson, with heart-shaped pupils and, of course, the song Heart-Shaped Glasses. The leading role in the film is that of Peter Lohr, who plays a mad scientist who can create life itself, but cannot create love without the woman uh, he so desires. This is, of course... This, of course, can be seen as a microcosm for Manson, 
as the artist who also brings to life his creations but cannot create love without another complemental half to hold. Peter Lore and Mad Love. The full name of that song just mentioned, by the way, is Heart-Shaped Glasses, When the Heart Guides the Hand, containing a clear allusion in this context to child molestation, which I'm not sure, I don't think that's what he meant, but uh, next the author quotes the girlfriend, uh, 19-year-old Evan Rachel Wood, who in 2007 commented on her own version of the tattoo. It's a lightning bolt for David Bowie, who inspired me to act and sing and a black heart. That was my present from Manson. Somebody came to the house. We both got black hearts. It represents Mad Love. Shot from Mad Love with Peter Lore. The author also mentions that the logo was used on the stage set of Manson's Rape of the World tour. In the film Mad Love, Peter Lore plays Dr. Gogol, or Gogol a Frankenstein-type character who secretly transplants a pair of hands from the body of an executed murderer to the husband of the woman he loves, in hopes of winning her favor. The husband is a famous pianist, uh, Stephen Orlock, whose hands were crushed in a train accident. He finds that he cannot play piano, uh, piano with these new hands, which he uh, doesn't even know are not his, but is compelled to commit murder. Eventually, the woman ends up at Dr. Gagal's house, and when he still refuses his, or when she still refuses his affections, he tries to kill her, declaring each man kills the thing he loves. From the booklet for a Marilyn Manson album called Mad Love. Um, so maybe she's talking about Eat Me, Drink Me. Note that the hand and wrist are disembodied with a line drawn between hand and wrist to ind indicate that these two will be cleaved apart. The heart is also piercing the picture of the eye below, out of which a triangle has been cut. Strangely, Peter Lore acted in another movie with related themes called The Beast with Five Fingers. In it, a crazy butler imagines that the disembodied hand of his dead master, a famous pianist, has come to life to perform several murders and to play the piano again. Also noteworthy is that while he was alive, the pianist kept a young female as an assistant so that he could draw energy from her life, and even declared that he didn't need food because of this. The meaning behind the mystical hand symbolism is obscure. The beast with five fingers, the crazy butler, is pursuing the mysteries of the universe in old astrology books, but they never develop this idea much. However, the numerology of the hand, or the human hand, is mentioned, without occult connotations, in a scene in which the dead pianist's nephew recalls how he had been taught as a child to remember the combination of his uncle's safe. It's 8, 5, 14, 27, based on the number of bones in the hand. Eight bones has the carpus, five the metacarpus, fourteen the phalanges, all in all, twenty-seven. The same hand numerology and the mystical ideas connected to it have been explained recently in this popular video from Marty Leeds about the numbers written on John Podesta's hands in, str in a strange photograph he emailed to a colleague. And as I explained in my own video on this subject, this mystical number set connected to the myth of Osiris also relates to the subject of cannibalism. Both Mad Love and The Beast with Five Fingers were variations on the story from an earlier silent film, The Hands of Orlock. Similar concepts were used in the occult horror film Mephisto Waltz from 1971, in which a warlock pianist and his witch daughter, who is also his lover, use black magic to live forever by jumping into other people's bodies when the previous host's body has been worn out. However, the pianist must also, uh, always seek a replacement body that has appropriate hands for playing the piano. Interestingly, this film stars Alan Alda, son of Robert, Al or son of Robert Alda, who starred in The Beast with Five Fingers. There are many layers to this hand symbolism, some of which will have to be explored in future writings. Part of it, though, is the idea of letting one's hand be used as the devil's plaything in that through possession of the body, or even merely the hand itself, one might be, uh, not be able to control and therefore might not be culpable for whatever the hand does, be it to create depraved art or to commit a sex crime or a murder. 
Truly, the left hand does not know what the right, is, uh, the right hand is doing, because the conscious mind does not even know. I can confirm this. Uh, this is what happens when one uses a Ouija board effectively. The Surrealists allowed their hands to be possessed for automatic writing, painting, and drawing. On another page of the same Marilyn Manson fan site mentioned above, it talks about how another Manson symbol, the Stigmata M, is derived from the film poster for yet another movie starring Peter Lore, Fritz Long's M, about a serial child rapist and killer. It shows a hand marked with the letter M for murderer. Fritz Long's M. Marilyn Manson's Stigmata M. Read the article about the Stigmata M. The author believes that Manson has referenced the film in his videos many times, including the balloons that the killer used in the film to lure his victims. A number of other symbols used by Manson are described on the same website. Indeed, he has used quite a lot of the symbols that I've written about in my own books, including the Cross of Lorraine and the Crucified Serpent, which, as I have explained in my books, in which the Manson website points out, is connected to the dollar sign. Employed simultaneously as the Eat Me, Drink Me heart were the heart-shaped glasses referencing the movie poster for Stanley Kubert's Lolita. Again, pedophilia is the joke. Also, surely there is some connection with the idea that love creates blindness and also er, and causes one to see the world through rose-colored glasses. Evan Rachel Wood in Manson's video. Hearts within the eyes were also used in the art for the Eat Me, Drink Me project. The words Eat Me, Drink Me come from Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, and this brings up a number of relevant connotations. The first is pedophilia. The character of Alice is based on a little girl, Alice Liddell, who was friends with the author Lewis Carroll, and whom many people think he had a, se a sexual relationship with. Therefore, Alice has become a symbol for girl lovers everywhere, and the pedophile holiday, Alice Day, is named after her. Considering this, it is interesting to note that the little girl in the film Mephisto Waltz had characters from the Alice books all over her walls. Also, consider that the White House held a secret Alice-themed Halloween party in 2009, attended solely by military and White House staff families, along with celebrities like Johnny Depp and, the decorated, and decorated by Tim Burton himself, whose new Alice movie wouldn't be released for several more months, and who they were also planning on having Marilyn Manson instead of Johnny Depp be until they, uh, Tim Burton decided not to. This was the same year in which Obama purportedly spent $65,000 of the taxpayers' money flying in pizza and hot dogs, or dogs, child sex slaves, supposedly, from Chicago for a private party, as WikiLeaks reveals. The second connotation always connected to Alice is that of going down the rabbit hole. In modern parlance, this is used to mean initiation into a secret set of knowledge, and quite often, learning the twisted details of a criminal conspiracy. In the actual books, it is more specifically about traversing a portal into the underworld. It is the same idea as getting lost in a labyrinth, being led into a trap through a mystery. Now consider the most quintessential labyrinth of the Western culture, the Temple of the Minotaur in ancient Crete. Fourteen virgin youths would be sent into a labyrinth every nine years to be ritually hunted, killed, and eaten by the half-human, half-bull monster within, who is himself a result of interspecies sexual depravities. The third association one always makes with Carol's Alice is the one implied by the words eat me and drink me, cannibalism and vampirism. I wrote about this in 2011 in connection to the myth of Saturn, eating children to maintain youth and negate time in my article Regnum in Potentia. And that was, I was just thinking about that, how she has this article about, or like, I think three... A series of three articles about money and sort of like pushing debt to the future and in a sense sacrificing the children of the future, uh, at least, you know, economically or figuratively, which in some cases is somewhat literal, but I think it's this one. Um, and I'll link to these because these are... So one, some of her most important work, I think, are these articles on 
you know, money and its symbolism and history and all that. But uh, the connection here with the heart shapes and the eyes made by Marilyn Manson, heart-shaped glasses, heart-shaped pupils in the eyes, etc., indicates a method of hypnotism using extended eye contact that seduces the victim into willingly offering themselves for sexual purposes and to let the predator eat and drink their energy until they are sucked dry. However, most are psychic vampires, gaining their energy from their victims just by sucking their soul directly from the eyes through this hypnotic method. Now consider this performance art piece, A Minute of Silence, from Marina Abramovic, in which she stares at her former lover, whom she had not seen in 30 years. I wonder what he thought about the fact he looked uh, 30 years older when they saw each other again, but she didn't. Do you think she is sucking his soul out through his eyeballs here? A few years after this, he sued her for breach of contract. Returning to the subject of cannibalism, note this image from the video uh, for Marilyn Manson's Disposable Teens from the Eat Me, Drink Me album. So no, it's actually from Hollywood. But maybe he, she's confusing the article, which may have like went back and talked about this. But And also note the connotation of that title song. From the video for Disposable Teens, and no, it's from the Hollywood album. Now check out this image from the Instagram account of James Alephantis, owner of Comet Pizza at the center of Pizza Gate. Finally, note the similarity with this page from the bizarre children's books, The Secret Pizza Party, with its eyes wide shut theme. Now have a look at the art collection of Tony Podesta, John's brother, also implicated in Pizza Gate. There is a fucking perver or pervasive and pervertive, uh, perverted cannibalism theme, is there not? Note this woman is eating a liver and appears to be hogtied by invisible strings, invoking the contorted position of the Arch of Hysteria, which Tony Podesta also owns and which mimics the position of one of the victims of Jeffrey Dahmer, a cannibal. This is a piece from one of Tony Podesta's favorite artists, Biljana Djurjevic. Uh, and these are from a Marina Abramovic, another favorite of Tony's. Cannibalism is one of her main motifs. So, and I know a lot of this is like already hashed out. The reason I'm reading this is because I didn't even know, find this article till a few months ago, like a month ago. And um, it's just funny, like this is all actually pretty, like, pretty uh, groundbreaking for this topic, I guess. And it's just funny, no one's willing to cover it, or everyone has their own, like, you know, uh, what is it? Just, like, explaining the ways of these things. But I just, I don't know. It's too, it's like, they blend so much stuff together to make it just look like art that it's easy to write off. But uh, again, just for the record, I'm not making any claims or anything like that. I'm just going over this for the sake of analysis. But finally, this is hanging on the wall of his brother John's office. I say this as a person who has tons of weird stuff in her collection of stuff. This is a lot of money to spend on paintings of cannibalism. This is weird for sure. It would be nothing if it weren't for him being suspected of being part of a group that rapes, murders, and eats children, which is what seems to be hinted at when all of the content from the WikiLeaks Podesta emails and the Instagram accounts of the affiliated pizza companies are taken as a whole. I'll give you an idea of what I meant when I say I have some weird stuff of my own in my collection of art and literature. While researching the movie Mad Love, I kept getting the song Love Secret Domain by Coyle stuck in my head as they use those words in the lyrics. I decided to look it up on YouTube to hear it again. I discovered, for the first time, the official music video. Whoa, did I hit the pedo mother load. Check it out if you dare. It's not safe for work, or whatever L is, but uh, although it was published by the Wax, uh, Wax Tracks Records and even played on MTV during its day. Out of Light Cometh Darkness, Love Secret Domain... I used to listen to this song a lot. I first heard it at, at a place called the City Nightclub in Portland when I was 14. It was an all-ages club heavily utilized for drug trafficking and male prostitution, which is why it was featured in Gus Van Sant's film, My Private Idaho. 
My friends and I knew the song was demonic, and after we heard it one time while we were on acid, we got too freaked out to listen to it anymore. One time that I played it, the house settled all of a sudden, and a crack about four feet long formed in the wall right next to the ceiling. I really didn't know much about the band, save that they had created a soundtrack for the film Hellraiser that had been rejected. Only years later did I learn that they were all gay, thelemic magic uh, practitioners, and connected to several other bands that I liked. It was only yesterday that I saw the video for Love's Secret Domain for the first time, and saw the pedophile content. A harem of uh, young Asian boys in loincloths dancing lewdly with the performer and each other, pouring candle wax on their own chests while he fondles them and gnashes his teeth. I now realize that some of the lines overtly refer to violent sodomic sodomic child rape. I quote, In the little uh, children's heavy heads, my dreams erupt while in my bed. Innocence is dripping red. They all speak of sadistic torture for the mystery of evil. Sweet tortures fly on mystery wings. Pure evil is when flowers sing. My heart, my heart is a rose. Finally, there are references to bondage, the leash, and giving in to madness. Give sanity a longer leash, but some of us have sharper teeth in love's secret domain. In the video, as he sings about days devoured by hungry nights, he bares his teeth and pretends to eat his own fist. Then, when he sings about the line about sharper teeth, he bites in the direction of one of the four dancing slave boys. This perhaps hints at the sadistic love bites, or worse, the cannibalism that sometimes occurs after children have been raped and murdered. The cover for this single release shows a variation on the mutilated Mono Pontea that I mentioned in my previous article. Uh, Jeffrey Dahmer, Alistair Crowley, Exorcist 3, 9-11, and Pizzagate. In this version, the three fingers of blessing remain, uh, remain, thumb, index, and middle finger and it is the other two that have been sacrificed. Mutilated hand from Love's Secret Domain. It is probably because I've been writing so much about Cybele castration rituals lately that I was thinking, or I'm thinking this way, but the use of the term blood sickle makes me think of the sickle that was used by Kronos to uh, to castrate his father Uranus. Manson holding a baby skeleton with his thumb over the crotch. See, I've I had a shirt with this on it a long time ago. I never noticed that. I mean, I wouldn't have thought much of it. But, but of course, it also connects via the flower known as honeysuckle with the song's other theme of sucking honey, which is explored further on in this article. Also, clearly, it is a confession that the singer's heart, containing his capacity for erotic love, is sick, poisoned by an invisible worm of pure evil. Quite literally true, and this video obviously demonstrates. The main inspiration for this song is a poem from William Blake called The Sick Rose. O rose, thou art sick, the invisible worm that flies in the night in the howling storm, has found out thy bed of crimson joy, and his dark secret love does thy life destroy. Dark secret love, that's also a uh, hymn or Bill Vallow song. Other references in the lyrics are to The Vision of the Void, gay literature by Yukio Mishima, and The Vision in the Voice, a text by Aleister Crowley about his homosexual rituals. It's not about the homosexual rituals, it's just, it's more about the result of the rituals, but with Victor Neuberg in Algeria. The line, heads on fire and drunken lights, may refer to the alleged sparks of light that some people who claim to have been raped in pedophile sodomy rituals report experiencing, after the kundalini is released from their rectal area and into the brain, as I mentioned here. And see, because of this crap, like, I've heard of some of this dark, like, inverted bullshit, but it uh, only it just gives it, a, like, all this stuff a really bad look, I mean... Oh, oh, well, it's like some people will never get beyond like, I don't know. Some people only get into this stuff for that, for like the dark, evil, crazy shit. I don't know. Also note this video made by P.R. Koenig of the Fraternus Saturn, uh, Saturni, the Brotherhood of Saturn, which seems to be a German OTO lodge. So I don't know. I know this was an old 
group and he kind of talks about it on his para religion website, but I don't think it's still around. Maybe, who knows? The video is called Secrets of the Rosicrucians, Templars, and the Illuminati. It just shows a nearly naked man blindfolded with his hands bound behind his head and with Christmas lights wrapped around his head, sticking his tongue out lewdly as if trying to lick the lights. We also see him bound with his arms over his head in a manner very similar to one of the uh, pieces of art made by Podesta, favorite, Bilijana Djurjevic, called Paradise Lost. Paradise Lost by Djurjevic. Amazingly, there is another image from an occult-themed film that this image reminds me of. It is the final shot from Andy Warhol's Flesh for Frankenstein, starring Udo Kier. This is a hideous film about a mad scientist trying to create the perfect artificial man and woman by stitching together the body parts of living people who are murdered for their perfect features. He wants his golems to mate to create the perfect super race based on the ancestral qualities of the Serbs, the race to which he belongs. This is interesting because the artist Djurjevic is also Serbian. Serbia is a place known for being the location of hardcore child rape and snuff pornography, as featured in the movie A Serbian Film. In Flesh for Frankenstein, the scientist develops a lust towards his female golem's gallbladder. He actually opens up her side and rapes it. He tells his assistant, to understand death, you have to fuck life in the gallbladder. This then inspires his assistant to murder an old woman so that he can open up her stomach and rape her, inter or her internal organs also. Alchemist and murderer Gilles de Ray also famously raped the organs of his child victims. The idea of creating a magical child by depositing your seed into an alternative womb of some sort, is a treasured secret of sex magic. Now look at the dirty tiled walls in the background of the image below from Flesh for Frankenstein, and compare it with the tiles in this Djurjevic painting. Don't they look similar? Go to Djurjevic's website, and you will see that actually the majority of her paintings, which mostly feature children that look abused and semi-naked, have these tiles in the background. This brings us back to the video produced by P.R. Koenig of the Brotherhood of Saturn. Note uh, the part in which the star of the video licks his tongue towards a man standing next to him with a box over his head, onto which has been pasted Crowley's drawing of Lom, an entity he channeled at one point in his career. Lam or Lom may were, uh, very well have been the consciousness of one of Crowley's own magical children, conceived during a sex magic ritual. In the video description, Koenig has quoted Aleister Crowley's comment on the sup uh, superiority of doing anal rather than vaginal, or vaginal sex magic, with the anus metaphorically referred to as the Eye of Horus. Oh, how superior is the Eye of Horus to the mouth of Isis, the child of such a love, uh, 11th degree OTO, is a third person, a holy spirit, so to speak, partaking of both natures, yet boundless and impersonal because it is a bodiless creation of a holy divine nature. Koenig then links to his own article about the 11th degree of the OTO, Rocket to Uranus, Anal Intercourse in the OTO, where the following image and caption is shown, explaining or explained as lamb being birthed from an anus. Crowley's dream of giving birth to a fetus per anum a mass of blood and slime. This explains why towards the end of Conan's video, the image of Lom is shown upside down. The star of the video is also wearing a ski mask with a David Bowie style lightning bolt over the eye. I wrote in my recent article how I felt that David Bowie may have been the product of such a sex magic ritual, and Marilyn Manson's girlfriend Evan Rachel Wood got tattooed with her own version of the Eat Me Drink Me Heart that included the lightning bolt as an homage to David Bowie. Note that Harry Potter, a fictional magical child, sports the lightning bolt as a symbol of his unusual conception. Now let's return to the coil song mentioned above. The comparison in love's secret domain of the heart to a rose is not an uncommon one, but considering that we are dealing with a song apparently written to celebrate gay pedophilic sex magic rituals, perhaps we should look deeper. An acquaintance on Facebook recently pointed out a correlation between the symbol of the rose and an overly abused prolapsed anus. He wrote, When a prolapse occurs, it, it's known as a rosebud. Then there is the sexual fetish known as prolapse party, 
which involves women pushing their own rosebuds then giving or getting them licked for orgasmic pleasure. He brought it up to the up to point out what he thought was the meaning of the cover art for the Red Hot Chili Peppers album Blood Sugar Sex Magic. Indeed, this subject is covered in Wiki, in the Wikipedia article on rectal pro, <laughs> on rectal prolapse. Rosebudding is so called as the appearance of the exposed rectum is said to resemble rosebud flowers. Rosebud pro- pornography, rosebudding, or rectal prolapse pornography refers to the anal sex practice, which occurs in some extreme anal pornography, whereby a pornographic actor or actress performs a rectal prolapse, whereby the walls of the rectum slip out of the anus. A rectal prolapse is a serious medical condition that requires the attention of a medical professional. However, in rosebud pornography, it is performed deliberately. Michelle Luke writing for Vice, argues that rosebudding is an example of producers making extreme content due to the easy availability of free pornography on the internet. She also argues that rosebudding is a way for pornographic actors and actresses to distinguish themselves. Repeated rectal prolapses can cause bowel problems and anal leakage and therefore risk the health of pornographic actors or actresses who participate in them. Luke also argues that some who participate in this form of pornography are unaware of the consequences. For an extreme example of what can happen, read 9-11 terror suspect returns to Guantanamo Bay after being allowed out for surgery to treat rectal injury from when he was sodomized by the CIA during interrogation. From the Daily Mail, October 17th, 2017. So, so we have it now established that this hermetic symbol of the rose can, in a certain context, indicate the anus. We also know that Crowley-affiliated groups like the OTO, which were influenced by Rosicrucianism, believe that artificial people can be magically er, engendered and uh, and born from a person's anus. The video from PR uh, Koenig even claims that this is the secret of the Rosicrucians, and of the Templars too. Now, let's have another look at the image that went along with William Blake's poem, The Sick Rose. Yes, there is a person emerging from the rosebud. I wonder what that means. It certainly brings a new interpretation to that mysterious final scene from Citizen Kane. Definitely a similar comparison is made by the band Coil between the anus and the symbol of the black sun on the cover for their album Scatology. I mean, again, it's also the rose and the cross in an inverted sense. Coyle's scatology, clearly correlating Satan, sodomy, and the black sun, repre- er, presented as an anus. On a related note, the reviewer here at he- uh, Heathen Harvest made some interesting observations about the song Ostia, the Death of Pasolini, from the Coyle album Horse Rotovator. Ostia, the Death of Pasolini, tells the story of the 1975 murder of a noted Italian filmmaker and anti-fascist agitator, Pier Paolo pa- uh, Pasolini at the hands of a young male prostitute in the Italian coastal city of Ostia. The 17-year-old boy had run over Pasolini's body with his own car after crushing his testicle with a bar and setting his body on fire. The lyrical, or lyrics of Ostia suggest an interesting perspective on the implications of Pasolini's murder. The song seems to suggest an almost erotic metaphysical ine- inevitability in his doom. It is almost as if the filmmaker may be considered, or might be considered, a sacrifice, as suggested by lines such as, Killed to keep the world turning, and Leon like a lion, sleeping in the sunshine, lion lays down, out of the strong came forth sweetness. The imagery of honey, sweetness, and death is common in Coyle's early work. It manifests visually in the Tainted Love video, as balance traps and suffocates flies and honey. Sweetness, which carries death, is not a challenging symbol to untangle in light of how sexual pleasure could quite easily equal death for gays and bisexuals in the era. Here, the line of, out of the strong came forth sweetness, is a reference to the biblical scripture Judges 14.14, which is known as Samson's Riddle. In the story, Samson kills a lion and, after some time, returns to the decaying corpse to find it has been colonized by bees who have built a thriving hive. The dead lion is literally seeping with honey, a grotesque and powerful image. This image of the lion corpse with the evocative slogan, Out of the Strong Came Forth Sweetness, uh, would be quite well known to any young English boy. 
It is the image on the tin of Lyle's golden syrup. The image is even carved in marble on the exterior of the factory in Tatin Lyle's Plaisto Wharf location. It may also merit mentioning that honey syrup has been cited as a lubricant for fisting and anal play, especially in the days before silicone-based lubricants were common and knowledge of spermicide as an HIV antagonist was known. As a result, honey carries yet another implication true to form with coil's tendency to play on multiple levels. This is also a reference to the ancient sacrifice, uh, sacrificial practice of begonia, which purportedly was done to entice bees to form their nests inside the carcass of the sacrificed animal so that they could be released dramatically in yet another ritual. We can read about it in the 10th century Geoponica compiled in uh, Constantinople. Build a house 10 cubits high with all sides of equal dimensions with one door and four windows, one on each side, Put an ox into it, 30 months old, very fat and fleshy. Let a number of young men kill him by beating him violently with clubs, so as to mangle both flesh and bones, but taking care not to shed any blood. Let all the orifices, mouth, eyes, nose, etc. be stopped up with clean and fine linen, impregnated with pitch. Let a quantity of thyme be strewn under, or strewed under the reclining animal, and then let windows and doors be closed and covered with a thick coating of clay to prevent the access of air or wind. After three weeks have passed, let the house be opened, and let light and fresh air get at, uh, access to it, except from the side from which the wind blows strongest. Eleven days afterwards, you will find the house full of bees, hanging together in clusters, and nothing left of the ox but horns, bones, and hair. The Wikipedia article also suggests that the Egyptian version of this ritual involving a bull's head may be the link between the name of the bull deity Apis and the identical word being used in Latin to denote bees. So I guess apiary possibly relates. Now recall that the presence of a plastic honey bear filled with the honey oozing all over the thighs of the man. So the honey bear, that's crazy. Uh, all over the thighs of the man having sex with pizza on the alephantis related Instagram post shown above. Finally, note the use of bees and honey in a variety of esoteric symbol sets, such as the frontispiece to Joachim Frisius's uh, Summum Bona. The Latin means the rose gives honey to the bees. So what is the honey? Semen, blood, or something more obscure? Let us return again, or once again, to William Blake in a book about his work called Blake and Tradition by Kathleen Rain. Analyzing his story of Lyca in The Marriage of Heaven and Hell, she writes, Blake would have been familiar from Taylor's Porphyry with the view that it is pleasure which draws souls downward to generation. The goddess Night advises Jupiter to make use of honey as an artifice to ensnare the god Saturn. When stretched beneath the lofty oaks, you view Saturn with honey by the bees uh, produced, sunk in ebriety, fast bind the god. The theologists obscurely signify, uh, signifying by this that divine nature become, uh, d natures become through pleasure bound and drawn down into the realms of generation. This pleasure, symbolized as honey, is the pleasure arising from copulation, the irresistible desire of sexual pleasure through which the moist soul comes to drink the honeyed cup of generation. Throughout this entire essay, I've revealed a number of symbols, some of them treasured as con uh, concealing great spiritual mysteries in the hermetic traditions of Western occultism, which all seem to be related to the ideas of raping children, consuming human flesh, and using the bodies of victims, both dead and alive, to breed supernatural entities, golems, homunculi, and many other things. As I mentioned in my article, Killing God to Become God, the souls that are incarnated in these rites are ensnared by the magicians performing them, seduced into coming into our, into our world, and then trapped inside of a carnal container of some sort. Symbols for this ensnarement have included butterfly nets and spider webs, with the soul symbolized as a butterfly that gets caught. The paragraph above, quoted from Kathleen Rain, indicates that the pleasure of copulation is what attracts the souls that incarnate in human and animal bodies. This goes along with what you find in the Tibetan Book of the Dead, written to instruct a deceased soul trying to find release from the cycle of incarnation. It warns that the soul will feel the need to find a body, and will come across couples having sex, 
but must resist the natural attraction to join with them, because this will lead to another incarnation. It stands to reason that if one is trying to ensnare the soul of a divine intelligence, one needs to use its extraordinary enticements. The quote above from Thomas Taylor's Porphyry refers to the Roman myth based upon the Greek that Saturn, Kronos, was usurped by his son, Zeus or Jupiter, when the latter, posing as his cupbearer, gave him poison to drink. Taylor calls it honey and implies that by offering it, Jupiter seduced Saturn from his lofty throne as the king of the gods, made him drunk with it, and then bound him. As an interesting aside, note that the slogan for the Canadian town of Tisdale was, until recently, the land of rape and honey, referring to rapeseed, and that uh, this is what inspired an album of the same name by the industrial music group Ministry. In other versions of the myth, there is a lengthy war between the, uh, their two factions before Saturn is subdued and imprisoned. But the poisoned cup incident is the beginning of the war. When he consumed the poison, Saturn vomited out the children he had eaten, all of Jupiter's siblings, who then joined him on the uh, battlefield against his cannibal father. But, as I have pointed out in previous articles, the term cupbearer was a term for a royal child sex slave. Jupiter had a penchant for boys, and it is likely uh, his father did as well. This is a story of using the offer of sodomy with a young boy to entice the Most High God down from his throne so that he can be imprisoned and his position taken over. I think that the use of the symbols I have mentioned in the context which I have described indicates that there is still an occult tradition in certain circles regarding this. There are people who think that this is the way to dethrone God. They think that the gods above are as sick as they are, and therefore they will be attracted most by mere, uh, not by mere heterosexual encounters, but by the abnormal and perverse. As the Templar artifacts of Hammerpurgstall's Mysterium Baphometus Revelatum illustrate, this is why the Templars ritualized the sodomy and sacrifice of young boys. On several of the artifacts, he found a phrase encoded on them. The distinguished charity of mete, or meat, uproots the enemy. The one called Meat, or Mete, is the Templar secret wisdom god Baphomet, or Baphomet. The distinguished charity could also be phrased peculiar or strange love. This strange love, or mad love, is signified by many other things in Western occultism, roses, honey, and now via Marilyn Manson's use of pedophile symbolism, a spiral heart can be added to the list. The enemy that it uproots is none other than the demiurge of the Gnostic or Ophite Gnostics, the god and creator of this world. The idea is that ultimately you must not only fuck, but also kill and eat the things you love in order to become one with them, even as God, they believe, does this to his own children. As I explained in previous articles, such as this, 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 and this, which I did open them, it's, I believe these ones... And maybe I missed one, but I'll open them just in case. So yeah, the Jeffrey Dahmer, Alice Crowley, Exorcist one. Earthquake Knights, how they use sex, sex rituals to create seismic events. Again, some of this is just so, like, out there. It's just fun to, like, you never know what to expect, so it's fun. I believe these things are all parts of a process of trying to upset the balance of the pillars that uphold our current state of existence, allowing them to collapse so that the universe we live in might be destroyed. When the innocent body of a human child, the image of God, is defiled in rites such as this, it creates a reflexive reaction that affects the magnetic polarity of the earth and upsets the tectonic plates beneath us. It is hard for even the good people of this earth to stop this process when we are all, to a greater or lesser de degree, being seduced by the same type of perversions. Even if we have never done the worst of these things, we have participated gleefully in a culture that celebrates it. Perhaps this was the year that the Pope asked us to pray for God's mercy, because this was the year in which the fullness of our sins was revealed to us. I wonder if there are any uh, are enough righteous people among us to earn God's mercy, or if we shall all inevitably perish in the wages of our own sins. Wow. So yeah, I wanted to read that because it's just like no one else is probably ever going to, and it'll probably just get lost in the abyss. And so, um, again, as much as I like Marilyn Manson, and you know, I waited 
years, like after his Lest We Forget, which is when I found out about him, like 2004 um, and five. And I started studying him like just in that short time before Eat Me, Drink Me came out. And I was somewhat disappointed. Like at first I was like, oh, Eat Me, Drink Me. It's just like a love, love album type thing. And it was kind of like different compared to his older stuff. But then it took a while and I saw like the, the, the uniqueness of it, like the musical, I like the guitars and eat me, drink me. And just that cinematic sound, I guess, like there's something cinematic about it. I mean, there's something cinematic. He applies cinematics to like all of his stuff, especially the high end of low, but, um, eat me, drink me. It's different. There's something like, I don't know how to explain it. It's psychedelic in a weird way. Almost like a Christmassy psychedelic feeling. I don't know. Um, which he does reference Christmas, but, um, what was I going to say that album represented to me like a shift in his career. And ever since then he's been a little more like he even talks about in his interviews and he used to make music to like make people not to make people mad but because he was angry and not in the best state of mind and a lot of people will say oh his older stuff is good but his new stuff sucks and it's like it's just a different person and a different purpose and uh i don't know i think i don't think people are taking that into account when judging him based on this recent hate campaign and all that and again like me reading this probably won't help anything but People already make up their own minds anyway, and no one can desert, like, no one can entertain an idea without accepting it. So, what does it fucking matter anyway? Um, I still never saw this movie, and I want to see M. I'll probably put that as one of, like, the silent films to one of those chapters. Um, and I don't know if I'll read. Why so much rape and murder, blood and pain, and black magic? It's a matter of degree. But, uh, luckily these are archived. Libra Oz. Yeah, there's, Crowley, it, like, features or cut surfaces in many movies, including one of the Hellraisers, he's on the wall in a picture, and um, can't think of all the other instances. I know in the the craft movie, there's like a book on the shelf of his. Um, not that interesting, but so yeah, I'm not going to read all these. I just thought that that one article was interesting, like as crazy and out there as, as it is, no one else is really willing to go that far with it and like point this stuff out, even though like, I never would have made these connections in, at first, like, glance. You would think it's all just, like, jumping to conclusions or whatever. But if you just think about it for a while and study all this stuff, like, it's hyper-symbolism at, at the very least. Like, whether or not it's literal or anything like that, I think it's beside the point. But um, there's definitely something deeper to a lot of these points she's making. And I think that she kind of, like, if you look at her older articles and stuff, she slowly got more and more into this, like, dark side of the occult. Like, the occult is already a cult, but this, like, particularly dark side. Um, and I don't know. I know she, she had... I don't know how close she was to Manson. Like, if they ever talked or were friends. But I know she interviewed Madonna, Madonna Wayne Gacy... He started using, or Manson started using the Cross of Lorraine around the same time she started talking about it. So, uh, I don't know. Eventually I'll possibly read this, but for now, thank you, Tracy, for everything you did. Okay, so that whole <laughs> article, or whatever you want to call it, from Tracy Twyman is obviously pretty out there, and but... I think the reason I read it is because, I mean, not only does it mention Lom and uh, just this whole idea, which kind of parallels the chapters that talk about it in um, Persephone of this sort of weird idea of like in which 
talks about in the Arabian Nights, and then also that uh, book, The Ancient Secret, references the Arabian Nights. And Crowley obviously was very influenced by that and uh, Richard Burton in general, and the whole Islamic uh, Sufi mysticism and the whole idea of jinn, and just this whole idea of like coupling of the various couplings to create different offspring, I guess, uh, in either mystical or mundane means. And that's the whole weird paradox of like the mystical and the mundane or the transcendental, as well as the, I guess, opposite, which would be like the infernal. Um, and they're paralleling on mundane planes uh, in this sort of like labyrinthine topology or topography or whatever of um, just the whole, the labyrinth again as essentially parallel to the tree of life, especially with the number 793. Ox Chaim as 788 is usually how it's referenced, but with the hey being the 793 comes up and that whole complex is very important. Um, especially being one more than 792, which is 72 times 11, Shem, uh, Shemhem Farash, and the whole Clifoth. Uh, so this book from Sigmund Freud, actually, well, actually, volume one, really, of the standard edition of the complete psychological works of Sigmund Freud, um, has all these different papers, these uh, pre-psychoanalytic publications and unpublished drafts, and I was originally just going to, like, I wanted to read this Appendix C, The Nature of Q, and, but I just want to talk about this sort of weird situation and circumstance regarding that letter and all this subsequent uh, stuff, real, like, relating to the symbolism of Q, which I was already, like, talk. I had mentioned before the Q phenomena or whatever happened in 2017 and onward. And, um, cause Ken, again, Kenneth Grant talks about tunnel Q and cough and the symbolism of cough being related to not just the subconscious mind, but the whole idea of clefotic tunnels and veils and blinds and gateways, etc. essentially of the unconscious, subconscious and unconscious strata of the mind which again, this book by Henry Ellenberger is like the history of the discovery of the unconscious. And when you look into it, the occult and mesmerism, magnetism, all that uh, comes obviously was the basis, similar to how like alchemy and that sort of stuff was the basis of chemistry. Um, and this symbolism hasn't like let like let up or went away it's actually more profuse and um so looking at it through that lens this whole thing that uh freud apparently a pre in his pre-analytic days uh publications or whatever um it called like referenced this thing he called q which is essentially this like neuronal energy and it's similar it reminds me of Wil uh, Wilhelm Reich and his trying to ascertain this sort of life energy as well. Um, but he has other sort of symbols and uh, like the psi, like the chapter right before, not really chapter, but the appendix right before C is normal psi processes, which he uses this Q as a term throughout. And so again, it's just funny that we have this extra simulacrum uh, to further ward off and bind and sort of like dissociate these terms and these uh, developments and these things. But real quick, just to try to keep this as cleaned up, I mean, and simple, there's one other little letter, and I come across Freud mentioning the Malleus Maleficarum, I think somewhere, somewhere else, it wasn't this, but this letter is where he's talking about it, and it says letter 57, dated Vienna, January 24, 1897. It says, the idea of bringing in the witches is gaining strength, and I think it hits the mark. Details are beginning to crowd in. 
their flying is explained. The broomstick they ride on is probably the great Lord Penis. Their secret gatherings with d dancing and other amusements can be seen any day uh, in, the, in the streets where children play. I read one day that the gold which the devil gives his victims regularly turns into feces. And the next day, Air E, uh, a very long-standing patient of this period, referred to in the editor's notes to analysis, Terminable and Interminable, 1937, Stanford, or Standard Edition, uh, Volume 23, page 215. His nurse and first love, as he called her, was a French woman named Louise, who describes his old nurse's money deliria to me suddenly. Uh, see footnote 3, page 273 below. Um, by a round path, a roundabout path via Cagliostro or Cagliostro, alchemist Ducatenscheiser. So this, I have read this before. That's where I got this idea of the Ducatenscheiser uh, for that frontispiece, if you want to call it that, for the blog. Said that Louise's money was always feces. So in the witch stories, uh, it is merely being transformed back into the substance from which it arose. If only I knew why the devil's semen is always described as cold in the witch's confessions. So again, cold and gold are both 107. Uh, in the, so I have ordered a copy of Malleus Maleficarum, and now that I have put the final touch to my Kinder Lamungen, I shall study it diligently. The 15th century work, The Hammer of Evil Doing Women, by Springer and Kramer on Medieval Witches. The, inf uh, the Infantile Cerebral Palsies, 1897a, was Freud's last purely neurological work. Um, the Story of the Devil, the vocabulary of popular swear words, the songs and habits of the nursery, all these are now gaining significance for me. Can you, without trouble, recommend me some good reading from your well-stocked memory? In connection with the dancing in witches' confessions, Remember the dance epidemics in the Middle Ages. Ease Louise was a dancing witch of that kind. He was, first, consistently enough, reminded of her at the ballet, hence his theater anxiety. Alongside of flying and floating on the air, are to be put the gymnastic feats of boys in hysterical attacks, etc. So that makes me think of that arch of hysteria. Uh, I have an idea shaping in my mind that in the perversions of which hysteria is the negative, uh, this parenthetical remark, which is already hinted at above, page 239 and 240, is con uh, constantly repeated in the form, neuroses are the negative of perversions, in Freud's later words. See, for instance, the three essays, 1905D, Standard Edition, Volume 7, page 165. We may have before us a residue of a primeval sexual cult which in the Semitic East, as Moloch and Astarte, was once, perhaps still is, a religion. Perverse actions, moreover, are always the same, with a meaning and made on some pattern, which will be possible to understand. I dream, therefore, of a primeval devil religion, whose rites are carried on secretly, and I understand the severe therapy of the witches' judges. The Connecting Links Team Another tributary to the stream is derived from the consideration that there is a class of people who to this very day tell stories like those of the witches and of my patients. They find no belief, though their own belief in them is not to be shaken. As you have guessed, I mean the paranoiacs, uh, who, whose complaints that people put feces in their food, ill-treat uh, Ill them at night in the most abominable way, sexually, etc., are pure content of the memory. This idea often occurs or recurs in Freud's later writings. See, for instance, The Psychopathology of Everyday Life, 1901b, Standard Edition, Volume 6, page 256, where in an editor's footnote, a number of other references are given. As you know, I have distinguished between delusions of memory and interpretive delusions, page 227, uh, note 2. The latter are connected with the characteristic indefiniteness concerning the evil doers, who, of course, are concealed by the defense. One more detail. In hysterical patients, I recognize their father behind their high standards in love, their humility towards their lover, or their being unable to marry because their ideals are unfulfilled. 
The basis for this is, of course, the height from which a father looks down on a child. Compare with this the combination in paranoiacs of megalomania with fictions of an alienation of parentage. At this period, Freud seems to have been inclined to restrict these fantasies to paranoiacs, but before long he extended their field to neurotics in general and found a new name for them, family romances. See below, pages 253 and 265 in the paper with that title, 1909C, Standard Edition, Volume 9, page 238. That is the reverse side of the medal. At the same time, I am becoming less certain about a suspicion I have hitherto been nourishing that the choice of neurosis is determined by the period at which it originates. It seems rather to be fixed in earliest childhood. But the decision seems uh, to keep on oscillating between the period at which it originates and what I refer or prefer at present, the period at which repression occurs. CF page 231. So it's just interesting how he talks about this ancient, this like, he says, uh, we may have before us a residue of a, of a primeval sexual cult which was once and perhaps still is a religion. And he says, I dream, therefore, of a primeval devil religion whose rites are carried on secretly, and I understand the severe therapy of the witch's judges. So um, it's just interesting. Like, uh, And he knows that this problem of hysterical uh, attribution, like, I don't know, it's just weird. Um, I wanted to quote that before going in on, and I think it's, I know he re begins ref referencing this whole Q thing in, um, I think right here, Project for a Scientific Psychology, if I can find the beginning of it. So part one, general scheme, introduction. The intention is to furnish a psychology that shall be a natural science, that is, to uh, represent physical processes as quantitatively determinate states of specif uh, specifiable material particles, thus making those processes perspicuous and free from contradiction. Two principal ideas are involved. One, what distinguishes activity from rest is to be regarded as Q. So, in a footnote to his contribution to Studies on Hysteria, 1895D, Standard Edition, in Volume 2, page 195, Brewer remarks that the, con uh, the conception of the energy of the central nervous system as being a quantity distributed over the brain in a changing and fluctuating manner is an old one. He goes on to quote from the early 19th century French physician, Georges Cabanis, 1824, in um, Volume 3, 153, a discussion of Q will be found in Appendix C, page 392 below, which I'll get to. Um, what distinguishes, so subject to the general laws of motion, so what distinguishes activity from rest is to be regarded as Q, subject to the general laws of motion. Two, the neurons, or neurons, um, the term neuron, neuron with an E, uh, as a description of a or of the ultimate unit of the nervous system, had been introduced by W. Waldayer in 1891. Freud's own histological researches had led him towards the same finding. See especially Freud 1884f, and a note on this in Standard Edition, Volume 3, page 230. The neurons are to be taken as the material particles. N and K, or, well, cough, heta, uh, Q, E, or H, really, in Greek. Similar experiments are now frequent. CF, for instance, Exner, 1894, with a similar title and a similar program, very differently carried out. So, he goes on and on here in this. I'm not going to read this, but it goes, this is where he explains more fully this Q, or K, as he calls it. And it, that just makes me think of what Kenneth Grant talks about as the quay, or tail, also related to the kef, or cough, or kepsh, meaning the haunch, or like thigh, and that relates to time, essentially, and this moving, um, 
and generating aspect of Ursa Major, Arctos, or um, really what, where the swastika comes from, um, which relates again the 17 and hue. So obvious, obviously that whole inversion of that force is is symbolic. I mean, hue is really the inversion already of Resh in a sense, being the sunlight uh, reflected by the moon. And therefore, that's why this unconsciousness, the unconscious aspect and what the devil really represents in many ways, or at least connects to, um, in just the back of the head, the back of the mind, set, um, this plethotic aspect of the, you know, the Kabbalah, which there's this book actually I had learned, have read and found a long time ago called Sigmund Freud in the Jewish Mystical Tradition by David Bacon. And a big section of it is about the devil and the unconscious. And that's why I know about that. But then also the first, one of the first books, I think the first book I got from this library at, uh, in Arizona, Red Mountain Library, was Kabbalah by Gershom Sholem. And on the cover is this like Jewish dude, a Kabbalist down in a, like a study with a big spiral labyrinth next to him, or not labyrinth, a uh, spiral, what is it, staircase. And Freud talks about the staircase and the interpretation of dreams, and it's essentially like the libido, or the kundalini, you could say, and the staircase is 999, so the Masonic aspect of that is symbolic as well, like it all links together. Um, and so, I don't know, I just see this all as related, and Freud didn't get, or at least he may have knew, known like somewhat about the Kabbalah, but I didn't, I don't think he applied it to quite the extent that I, like, I found it applies. Um, so it's just funny, this whole Q thing, in now it's been, uh, demonized and turned into this weird culty fucking like weird thing which I know that I don't I never was a part of that thing I, I was very what is it skeptical and like I was just looking at, at it as an yet another manifestation or I mean really even a simulacra though but or just like a false manifestation of the sort of deceitful aspect of um, cough you know or the moon card and these, I don't know, it's just funny. Uh, but, so starting from this consideration, it was possible to lay down a basic principle of neuronal activity in relation to Q. Yeah, he just uses this thing. Uh, you'd have to really, I'll see if I can find, the reason I'm reading this is because I really couldn't when I Googled it. Um, a PDF or like, it's hard to access these books for some reason. Um, in, in full length. But yeah, Project for a Scientific Psychology. And so yeah, Q, quantity in general, or of the order of magnitude in the external world. And then K, QE, or Q, Heta, quantity of the intercellular order of magnitude. See page 306. And then he's also got like Phi, Psi, Oma, uh, Omega, W, V, and M. So, um, he wanted to make this sort of, like, like you said, a qualitative or quantitatively determinable psychological sort of map. But uh, let's see, Appendix C, the nature of Q, page 392. So it says, of the two principal ideas with which Freud introduces the project, see page 295, the neuron, so that's that thing I just referenced. The neuron in Q, there is no mystery about the first, but the second calls for some examination, especially as everything suggests that it was the forerunner of a, of a concept that was to place a fundamental part in, or that was to play a fundamental part in psychoanalysis. We are not concerned here with the special puzzle mentioned above in the editor's introduction of the distinction between Q and K. But or what we are dealing with in the uh, is K, as Freud himself explicitly states at the end of his first paragraph, a Q that has some special connection with the nervous system. 
How then did Freud picture this hue in the autumn of 1895? Apart from the obvious fact that he wanted to present hue as something material, subject to the general laws of motion, page 295, we notice at once that hue appears in two distinguishable forms. The first of these is hue and flow, passing through a neuron, a neuron or from one neuron to another. This is described in various ways. For instance, neuronal excitation in a state of flow, page 296, hue in flow, page 301, current in page 291 or page 298 or passage of excitation page 300 the second more static form is shown by a cathected neuron filled with q page 298 some remarks on cathexis in the editor's appendix to freud's first paper on the neuropsychoses of defense 1894a standard edition volume 3 page 65 the importance of this distinction between the two states of Q only emerges by degrees in the project, and one is almost tempted to imagine that Freud himself only became aware of it in the course of his writing the work. The first sign of this importance is in connection with the discussion of the mechanism for telling the difference between hallucinations and perceptions, and the part played in this mechanism by inhibitory action arising from the ego, sections 14 and 15 of part 1. The details of this inhibitory action, interference by a side cathexis, directed by a cathexis of attention from the ego, are given on page 323 through 4, and its outcome is to change the state of Q, which is in flow, into a state of Q, which is static in a neuron. A neuron. The distinction is presently, page 326 through 7, related to one between the primary uninhibited and secondary inhibited processes. Yet another way of describing the same distinction is introduced soon afterwards, page 335, with the notion that the interfering side cathexis has a binding effect on the cue. It is not, however, until part 3 of the project, page 368, that the full implications are displayed of the distinction between a bound and a mobile state of Q. The necessity for the hypothesis of there being two states of Q arises at the point in connection with Freud's discussion of the mechanism of thinking, which calls for a state in the neuron which, though there is a high cathexis, permits only a small current, page 368. Thus, Q would appear to be measurable in two ways by the height of the level of cathexis within a neuron, and by the amount of flow between cathexis or cathexes. Uh, this has been seized upon sometimes as evidence that Freud really believed that Q was simply electricity, and that the two ways of measuring it corresponded to amperage and voltage. It is true that some 18 months before the composition of the project in his first paper on the neuropsychoses of defense, 1894a, he made, or he had made a vague comparison between something that was a precursor of Q, uh, Q and an electric charge spread over the surface of a body. Standard edition, volume 3, page 60. It is also true that Brewer, in his theoretical contribution to studies on hysteria, 1895d, published only a few months before the project was written, had devoted some space to an electrical analogy to the excitations in the conductive paths of the brain. Um, volume 2, 193 through 4. Nevertheless, nowhere in the project is there a word to suggest that any such idea was present in Freud's mind. On the contrary, he repeatedly emphasizes the fact that the nature of neuronal motion is unknown to us. See, for instance, pages 372, 379, and 387. The electrical theory may, it is to be feared, have received a reinforcement from an unfortunate mistranslation in the standard edition, rendering of chapter 7, of the interpretation of dreams, where, in volume 5, page 599, line 4 from the bottom, the German niveau was quite unjustifiably translated potential. In later printings of the volume, the word has been corrected to level. There are, it must be admitted, some obscurities in the account given in the project of the nature of the bound state and of its mechanism. One of the most puzzling of these relates to the account given in the process of judgment and the part played in it by a cathexis from the ego. This influence is described in a variety of ways. 
as a side cathexis or pre cathexis or hyper cathexis. Incidentally, there seems to be little justification for the idea that Freud restricted his use of this last term to cathexis from the ego, or to cathexis from the ego. See, for instance, libidinal hypercathexis in Totem and Taboo, 1912 through 13, Standard Edition, Volume 13, page 89. And it is closely involved in the idea of a cathexis of attention. It seems at first, page 324, that attention is only a means of directing the side cathexes to the place where they are needed. But elsewhere, page 368, it seems as though the hypercathexis of attention is in itself the force which produces the bound state. Indeed, the whole question of the relation of attention to Q needs examination. Free psi energy, Freud seems to call it in his letter to Fleece on January 1st, 1896. Appendix B above. So wait, free psi energy, Freud seems to call it. Attention makes an unostentatious appearance in section 14 of part 1, page 324, but soon begins to show its importance in section uh, 19 of part 1 and section 6 of part 2, while in part 3 it becomes an almost predominant feature. Nevertheless, in Freud's later writings, attention almost vanishes apart from a few sporadic mentions. Anonymous traces of it, however, persist to the very last along uh, two rather different lines, both of which go back ultimately to the project. The first and more obvious one relates to reality testing, and the history of this is fully documented in the editor's note to the Metapsychological Discussion of Dreams, 1917, uh, volume 14, page, pages 219 through 21. The other, less noticeable, but perhaps more important, concerns precisely the part played by attention uh, or similar agency in bringing about the distinction between Q in its bound and in its free state, and beyond that, between the primary and secondary processes. This function of attention is discussed in an editor's footnote to The Unconscious, 1015E, in volume 14, page 192. It is indirectly alluded to in Freud's very last works, Moses and Monotheism, 1939, in volume 23, page 97, and the outline of psychoanalysis, uh, I bid, page 164, from 1940, or, well, from 1938, published 1940. Whatever may be the precise details of the mechanism responsible for bringing about the transformation of free into bound Q, it is evident that Freud attached the greatest importance to the distinction itself. In my opinion, he wrote in The Unconscious, this distinction represents the deepest insight we have gained up to the present into the nature of nervous energy. Volume 14, page 188. Freud's strange and unexplained attribution of this discovery to Brewer is discussed in Volume 2, XXVII, or 27. And I forgot this footnote but one. An interesting sidelight on Freud's view of attention is provided by his remarking in several uh, connections that attention interferes with the efficiency of automatic actions and that these are assisted by its distraction. See page 29 ab above and an editor's footnote to lecture 30 of the new introductory lectures, 1933, in volume 22, page 40, where full references will be found. This quotation might also encourage us to hope that Freud's later writings will throw, on, uh, throw light on our immediate problem of the nature of Q. Q itself, under that name, never reappears, though there is no difficulty in recognizing it under various aliases, most of which are already familiar in the project. One particular one of these, psychical energy, demands attention, for it emphasizes what appears to be a vital change which the concept has undergone. Q is no longer something material. It has become something psychical. Psychical energy is found nowhere in the project. The term energy occurs very rarely indeed in the project in the sense of Q. The commonest synonym used is probably at citation. Psi energy, which occurs in letter 39, page 390, etc., means, uh, merely means energy from the neuronal system, psi. But it is already in common use in the interpretation of dreams. 
Nevertheless, the change does not portend complete abandonment of a physical basis. Even though Freud declares in Standard Edition, uh, Volume 5, page 536, that he will remain upon psychological ground, careful examination will reveal traces of the old neurological background. Even the well-known passage in the book on jokes, in Volume 8, page 148, from 1905, in which he appears to turn his back on neurons and nerve fibers, in fact leaves the door wide open for a physiological explanation. Indeed, in the sentence from the paper on the unconscious, 1915, quoted above, Freud speaks of nervous energy, not of psychical energy. On the other hand, in the German collected edition of 1925, he altered two words in the last sentence on the studies on hysteria, from nervous system to mental life. See volume 2, page 305. But however great or small this revolution was, there can be no question that many major characteristics of Q survived in a transmogrified shape to the very end of Freud's writings. Evidence for this is given by the very numerous footnote uh, references in these pages. A particularly interesting question arises as to the relation of Q to the instincts. These are scarcely mentioned here by that name. It is evident, however, that they are the successors to endogenous Q, or endogenous excitations. Some history of Freud's developing views on the instincts is given in the editor's note to Instincts and Their Vicitudes in volume 14, uh, page 111, and especially of his various classifications of them, first into libidinal and ego instincts and later into libidinal and destructive instincts. One point, not mentioned there, which is of special interest in the present context, is the suggestion, twice thrown out by Freud, of the possibility of an indifferent psychical energy, which may take either of the two instinctual forms, cf. the paper on narcissism, 1914, and volume 14, uh, page 78, and the ego and the id, from 1923, in volume 19, page 44. The German word is indifferent in both of these passages. Unfortunately, in the second one, this is translated too loosely, uh, neutral instead of indifferent, which has incidentally led to the earlier passage being overlooked. This indifferent psychical energy seems very much like a harking back to Q. These later uncertainties about the instincts, entities which, like Q, are on the frontier between the mental and the physical, and about their classification, remind us that Freud was always quite consistent in emphasizing our ignorance of the basic nature of Q, or its doublets. This, as we have seen in page 393, is often insisted on in the project itself. But the point recurs again and again in later works, to name only a few in the Interpretation of Dreams, 1900, volume 5, page 599, in the paper on The Unconscious, 1915, volume 14, and uh, page 188, and in Moses and Monotheism from 1939, in volume 23, page 97. This conclusion is stated most plainly of all in Beyond the Pleasure Principle from 1920, in volume 18, page 30, where he says, The indefiniteness of all our discussions on what we describe as metapsychology is, of course, due to the fact that we know nothing of the nature of the excitatory, or excitatory process that takes place in the elements of the physical systems, or psychical systems. So he says, the indefiniteness of all our discussions and what we describe as metapsychology is, of course, due to the fact that we know nothing of the nature of the excitatory process that takes place in the elements of the phys or psychical systems, in that we do not feel justified in framing any hypothesis on the subject we are consequently operating all the time with a large unknown factor, which we are obliged to carry over and into every new formula. It seems then that our enquiry must end here in that we have no choice but to follow Freud in leaving the problem of Q unsolved. So Q is this psychical energy, essentially, if you were to name it, even though it has different, it can be bound, it can be uh, static or maybe not static, what's the other one, uh, and it's, it's cited. Um, 
But though the ultimate nature of Q was unknown to Freud, some of its essential features were always assumed by him and insisted upon till, uh, to the end of his life. If we turn back to one of its very earliest appearances, to which we have already referred on page 393, in the first paper on the neuropsychoses of defense in 1894, in volume 3, page 60, we find this unknown entity described as something which possesses all the characteristics of a quantity, though we have no means of measuring it, which is capable of increase, diminution, displacement, and discharge. It is, indeed, obvious that the mysterious Q was given its name for the very reason that it did possess these characteristics. Quantitative considerations had to be taken into account from the first at many points in Freud's theories. For instance, in The Asiology of Hysteria in 1896, we read that in the etiology of the neuroses, quantitative uh, pre preconditions are as important as qualitative ones. There are threshold values which have to be crossed before the illness can become manifest. So, this whole Q thing really makes me think of how certain aspects of the mind with our minds, with all these networks of consciousness and cybernetics essentially going into Norbert Wiener's work and all that, the cybernetics of all this stuff, this whole nature of Q is being, could be at least theoretically more easily ascertained. More important, however, is the fact that quantity is implicit in the whole theory of conflict as the cause not only of neuroses, but of an entire range of mental states. There are a number of passages in which this fact becomes explicit. For instance, in Types of Onset of Neuroses, from 1912, in Volume 12, page 236-7, in Lecture 23 of the Introductory Lectures, from 1916-17, through 17, in Volume 16, on page 374, in Some Neurotic Mechanisms from 1922, in volume 18, on page 20, er, 228, and in Analysis Terminable and Interminable from 1937, in volume 23, on page 226 through 7. In this last case, the importance of quantitative factors is related to the therapeutic situation. But so it had been more than 40 years earlier in Freud's contribution to studies on hysteria in Volume 2, page 270. In his great paper on the unconscious from 1915, Freud used the term economic or economic as equivalent to quantitative. So again, it, may, it makes me think of Wilhelm Reich and the, his economic theories of organ or really the in, sex economy, the impulses of energy and all that. But we shall be right, therefore, in regarding our enigmatic Q, whatever its ultimate nature, as the progenitor of one of the three fundamental factors in metapsychology. So it says the identification was no novelty. It is to be found in a letter to Fleece, quoted above, page 283, written several months before the project. So this term Q for psychological or psychical energy goes back to the late 1800s, which is kind of crazy. Um, and so I just wanted to read that because, again, it's more bullshit stacked on top of stuff that's kind of interesting, enlightening, important, uh, useful, like, for synthesizing all this knowledge. And, again, I see this Q as such a, you know, really a tarot card and all the, you know, ideas that go along with that. Um, it's just ironic. And so I'm wondering how much I can even say regarding this, not even talking about the actual, th you know, the, or the thing that gets, you know, flagged or whatever. Um, just talking about this deeper stuff that that kind of acts as a lid on. But anyway, yeah, Freud Freud is yet another person who people just like throw the baby out with the bathwater about and don't actually read and go into his stuff. There's a lot there, and yet no one looks into it. But uh, 
I don't know, there's different, everyone hates the Jews, or wants, <laughs> they want to hate the Jews, and they want you to hate the Jews. But, uh, I don't know, it's all just back and forth bullshit. But, um, I don't know, that Q, the, the whole nature of Q as the psychic, a determinative for psychic energy is funny um, and telling. So anyway, these are the next chapters uh, that I read. I read them before I started using a different means of recording, and um, I know that the beginning of this video and possibly even this one will still have like this loud S's, but I tried to cover up the mic a little, and I still need to get it. I need to find this cord, but anyway. Chapter 5 of The Ancient Secret in Search of the Holy Grail by Flavia Anderson. The Phoenix in the Floating Stone. It is probable that the golden tree with its crystal apple was the most ancient setting for the Grail Stone. But there was, I think, another traditional framework for the jewel. The sun, as it rolled across the sky, was likened in nearly all mythologies to a wheel, and that this idea was used in the construction of a material symbol is shown by the illustration of a plaque in the British Museum, Plate 1, which records the restoration of the Temple of the Sun God by a Babylonian king in 900 BC. The wheel is evidently one of the sacred objects kept in the temple, and is placed in a position of importance immediately before the shrine, while the serpent, with the form of a canopy, guards the exit and entrance of the sun god's home. It is probable that this wheel was made of the bright gold, which reflects the sun's rays so brilliantly, and was therefore thought to have an affinity with the god. A very obvious place for the crystal would be at the hub of the wheel, and if many myths and legends support such an idea, we could make a fair guess that such was the case. Servius says that Prometheus stole fire from the sun's wheel, ad rotum solis ignum, but this, of course, might mean no more than that he obtained fire from the solar orb through some form of magnification of rays. ECL 642 that the two civilizations of the Euphrates Valley and the Valley of the Indus were in touch with one another is not to be denied, but the following ancient legend from India is more helpful to our inquiry. Once upon a time, the ambrosia of immortality was stolen from the gods by Garuda, who was half-giant, half-eagle, and the enemy of serpents. This lord of birds was hatched from an enormous egg 500 years after it had been laid by Diti, mother of giants. His father was Kasyapa, a Brahmin identified with the Pole Star, who had sacrificed with desire for offspring. It happened that Diti, having lost a wager, was put under bondage by the demons, and could not be released until she caused the ambrosia, known as Amrita, to be taken from a celestial mountain where it was surrounded by terrible flames, moved by violent winds which leapt up from the sky. Assuming a golden body bright as the sun, Garuda drank up many rivers and extinguished the fire. A fiercely revolving wheel, sharp-edged and brilliant, protected the Amrita, but Garuda diminished his body and entered between the spokes. Two fire-spitting snakes had next to be overcome. Garuda blinded them with dust and cut them to pieces. Then, having burst the revolving wheel asunder, he flew forth with the Amrita, which was contained in the Moon Goblet. See Indian Myth and Legend by Donald A. Mackenzie. The Moon Goblet is a beautiful description of a glass or crystal, and the account of how the eagle-headed god flew through the spokes indicates that the wheel was not the solar orb, but a symbol constructed to represent it. In Christian legend, the story of St. Catherine in Alexandria is connected with a wheel, Although she was supposed to have lived shortly after the time of Constantine the Great, her history was never recorded until the 9th century AD, and in the 15th century, attempts were already being made to banish her from the calendar on the grounds that the lady had never existed, that her story was apocryphal, and had been drawn from pagan sources. Because of her popularity, she survived as a saint, 
but no firm grounds have ever been found for her having really existed. According to legend, she was the daughter of Pharaoh, and was well versed in philosophy, particularly the works of Plato. She was converted to Christianity, and dedicated her virginity to God, taking Christ as her spouse, and receiving from him the mystical ring of this marriage. The tyrant Maximin then began one of the periodic persecutions of the church. Pagan philosophers and rhetoricians were sent by him to the young princess to persuade her to abjure her faith, but she defeated them all in argument, and Maximin therefore ordered her to undergo the most cruel death. She was bound on a wheel which had sharp spokes projecting from it, so that her flesh might be torn in pieces. But at the last minute fire came down from heaven, sent by the destroying angel of God, who broke the wheel asunder. Maximin had therefore to resort to the more merciful sentence of beheading the saint with a sword. See Sacred and Legendary Art by Mrs. Jameson, Volume 2, page 467. As it was the custom amongst medieval artists to represent a martyr with the instrument of torture which had caused death, and as St. Catherine is always pictured with her wheel, it is not generally realized today that in fact the wheel is the symbol for the fire from heaven which rescued her from the more cruel death. It seems very probable from this legend that the Pharaoh's daughter was in fact the crystal symbol of Isis, and it was bound at the hub of a golden wheel. It is necessary here to say a word concerning the triple character of the earth goddess. Apuleius, addressing Isis in the visionary passage of his golden ass, prays that, whether she be pleased to be known as Ceres, the harvest mother of Eleusis, or as Venus of Paphos, or as Artemis of Ephesus, or as dread Proserpine, or Persephone, she will, by whatever name, have mercy upon him. In fact, there was only the one goddess, though her names were multiple. Yet this one goddess was of triple character. Hecate's face is turned in three directions, says Ovid, in Fasti 1, 141. When King Arthur is mortally wounded, he is fetched by three queens. Mort de Arthur, Volume 3, Chapter 148. Though their names are not specified, we can supply them from Grail legend. The first, Blanchefleur, is the earth in springtime washed clean of the hot dust and filth by the flood waters of the Nile, but as yet unsown. Therefore, she is represented as a virgin, and amongst some of her various names, Coré or Cor, Pallas, Athene, and Artemis are familiar to us. Her character in summer becomes that of the Great Mother. She bears in her arms either a male child, the son of the sun, or else the fruits of the earth, and according to the temperament of the race who worshipped her, she may have the nature of the voluptuous Queen of Love. We know her as Ceres and Aphrodite and Guinevere. Finally, she becomes the earth in its winter habit, hideous, old, barren, revengeful, demanding to be propitiated with sacrifice, seeking the life of the slayer of her child, her child who is both sacred flame and springing corn. Her names are Hecate, Proserpine, or Persephone, the revengeful Juno, and in Grail legend, she is both the loathly damsel and Morgan Le Fay. In combination, the one goddess is known as the three fates, the three Eumenides, the three nymphs of the Hesperides, the three Norns of Scandinavian myth. The spindles made from the tree of life for Solomon's bed represented by their colors these three aspects of the earth goddess. The three fates, as also the three Norns, had spindles with which they spun the thread of life. The first was white, in token says the medieval poet of Eve's virginity. The second was green, in token of Eve's bearing Cain and Abel. The third was red, in token of the blood of Abel spilt by his brother. While I would not for a minute suggest that the monks of Glastonbury lent themselves intentionally to perpetuating a pagan cult, traditions die hard and I do suggest that some surviving folktale or memory may be responsible for the choice of the three female patron saints, which are depicted on the abbey seal used by Abbot Chinock until the dissolution, for the three together are intimately connected with the mysteries of the grail. I would ask the reader to turn now to the illustration of the seal on plate two. 
In the center stands Our Lady bearing the Holy Child, and in her other hand are the lilies always associated with her. Besides her is the sad Saint Margaret with her cross, symbol of mourning, and she stands upon the serpent dragon over which she was triumphant. I shall come presently to explain the significance of the Madonna lilies in the story of Saint Margaret, but for the moment we need to study only the figure of Saint Catherine, who stands on the Virgin's other side, holding her wheel in her hand. It will be remembered that in the prose Percival, the position of the hand of one of the three queens who visit Arthur's court to reproach Percival is said to have some connection with the mystery of the grail. It might be argued that the Arthurian queen's hand was bound or pointing to her necklace, and I will explain this overleaf. But here also, the hand of one of the three queens of Glastonbury is the clue to the mystery, for she carries the wheel which brought fire from heaven. And what is the inscription or legend round the seal? Testis adest isti scripta matrix pia et pi glastoni. There is at Glaston a witness to this writing, the holy matrix of God. Now, matrix is a very curious word to use if it describes the mother of God. Mater or genitrix are the words commonly employed. Matrix signifies a mold, cavity, or cup something out of which another thing is produced. In this sense, it can be used for a mold in which metals are smelted, or for the ore in which jewels are embedded, or for the womb of a woman, but not the woman herself. The words on the seal are, I am convinced, a reference to the grail, and that it was present at Glastonbury at that time was no empty boast, but a fact which I will presently show. In the appendix will be found my correspondence with the Keeper of Manuscripts at the British Museum regarding the accurate reading of the legend. To turn now to the question of the necklace, articles of jewelry provide an obvious setting for talismanic stones. The Seal of the Abbot of Glastonbury from Dugdale's Monasticon. To turn now to the question of the necklace, articles of jewelry provide an obvious setting for talismanic stones. Pliny says that the first use of finger rings was suggested by the rocks of the Caucasus, one of the richest sources of rock crystal, where Prometheus enclosed a fragment of an unspecified stone in iron for this purpose. Pliny, Natural History, Book 37, Chapter 1. That the institution of ring wearing should be attributed by tradition to the first fire bearer is significant as many of the myths in this book will lead us to suppose a magic ring, i.e. a ring set with crystal, together with the fiery brand was the regalia of the divine youth, bringing with it the curse of an untimely end. According to the Brehon laws of Ireland, only a person of royal blood might have his brooch decorated with crystal, but there are references to the archdruid's tiara and belt clasp being adorned with these snake stones. Druidism by Dudley Wright. And from the Druids, the privilege passed to the princes and bishops of the church, whose copes are fastened with such brooches. The association of the privilege with kings and priests indicates the holy qualities attributed to the stone, but it is doubtful whether the size of any stone set in a finger ring or brooch would be sufficient for the practical purpose of lighting a fire. The necklace of the Norse goddess Freya, however, may have contained a much larger jewel. It was called the Brisinga Men, or the Mighty Necklet of Brisings, and plays a most important part in Norse mythology, as we shall presently see, for it was the symbol par excellence of the earth goddess in springtime. Indeed, on one ludicrous occasion, the mighty and masculine god Thor was able to deceive the giants of the underworld into accepting him as the very person of the gentle and beautiful goddess, whom they sought to possess, because he wore her necklace. See Lay of Thrym in Poetic Edda, translated by Olive Bray. The Brisingamen may have been made to hang about the neck of some image of Freya, for Ovid tells us that a gold necklace decorated the marble image of Venus at Rome. The mysterious Arthurian queen, whose hand can point to necklace or wheel, is therefore pointing to the grail stone. One other article of jewelry can be mentioned here. 
that the culture of Egypt spread in some unknown fashion to Mexico and Peru has long been a supposition. And Professor Perry is one amongst many who believe that ships from the Mediterranean must have found their way across the ocean. In The Growth of Civilization by W.J. Perry, Chapter 4, page 71. The Spaniards recorded on their arrival in Peru that the heathen priests were accustomed to light their sacred fire from the sun's rays by means of a concave cup set in a metal bracelet. See Encyclopedia Britannica, 14th edition, under the article on fire. It has been shown that the tree, the wheel, the ring, and the necklace were traditional settings for a crystal gem. We turn now from the actual setting to the hidden language for describing the crystal or glass, the paraphrasis of which the Eddas are so fond, and we shall find it described as an egg, a vessel, and a window. The followers of Orpheus believed that the god was born from the Orphic egg. See Prolegomena to the Study of Greek Religion by Jane Harrison, page 464. Castor and Pollux, the mortal and immortal twins, were born from the eggs of a swan, and their sister Helen was worshipped in Rhodes as Helen Dendritus, the goddess bound to a tree, and was probably none other than the crystal within the golden leaves of Glacier, the prototype of all the maidens of Grail legends who are found bound to trees. See figure 6, Coin of Tyre from Zeus by A.B. Cook. Figure 6 shows a coin of Tyre, which depicts such a mystic egg, surrounded by the coils of a serpent with a tree behind it. The hermetic vase of the alchemists, decorated with a similar serpent, was known as the philosopher's egg. It is illustrated on plate 17 and 32 of Professor Reed's Prelude to Chemistry. The serpent's egg was known to be a famous talisman of the Druids. Pliny tells us about this Druidic talisman. But he falls into the error of supposing that the ovum and guinum was the production of real reptiles. Furthermore, he goes on to confuse it with a seashell, which was beheld to have magical life-giving properties, a common belief among primitive peoples who compare the shapes of certain types of mollusca to the female genital organs. But despite this confusion, he gives us a very vivid picture of how the talisman was produced. The snakes meet together on a certain day of the moon. They twist themselves together into many convulsions and hiss, and their saliva forms a bubble like a ring above the head of one of them, which the rest blow on till it comes off at the tail. Pliny, Natural History, Book 29, Chapter 12. This is nothing else but a paraphrastic description of blowing glass through the long pipes of the Sidonian glass blowers. And in Cornwall, they used to tell this story and assert that the egg hardened into glass. The Golden Bough, Part 7, Balder the Beautiful, Volume 1, pages 15 and 16. Pliny goes on to say that the egg will float, even though set in gold. And so it will if it be a glass sphere, empty of all but air. He who could obtain one of these eggs would prosper in all his undertakings. But to steal it from the serpents was not without peril. As it came from the tail of the serpent, it must be caught in mid-air into a cloak, and then he who had seized it must gallop on horseback and jump across a stream of water in order to avoid pursuit. It is known in Wales as the Glyne Nadir, the gem of the serpent, and is erroneously identified with the glass rings which the Druids wore as amulets, probably slung on a thong around their necks. These amulets have been found particularly near Aberfra and Anglesey. They are usually of green glass, but some are blue and some striped with blue, red, and white. Mythology and Rites of the British Druids by Edward Davies, pages, page 210. William Camden, the antiquary who lived in the 16th century, says that in many parts of Wales and throughout Scotland and Cornwall, it is the opinion of the people that the snakes meet in company on Midsummer's Eve to form these glass rings. Druidism by Dudley Wright, page 100. If we discount Pliny's statement that the finished product was a cartilaginous seashell, but accept his statement that set in gold it would float, and combine this again with the local folklore of it, uh, and combine this again with the local folklore of its being made of glass and the actual discovery of glass amulets, we shall arrive at the truth. 
that the Druids were able to blow glass, but that the egg was a glass sphere, while the amulets were ring-shaped. Pliny derides the possibility of snakes producing eggs at only certain phases of the moon, but when it is realized that the egg was the moon goblet, but when it is realized that the egg was the moon goblet, it is very probable that the glass was blown by moonlight at certain festivals with magical rites in honor of the goddess. It will be remembered that Peridor stole the stone from the serpent's tail. This serpent lived in a cairn surrounded by 300 knights, who were waiting for him to die in order to seize it themselves. Mr. Dudley Wright says that the druids were themselves called Nedred, or snakes, by the Welsh bards. As guardians of the glass egg, this would be a fitting nomenclature. We have in the Mabinogian, therefore, a picture of Peridor succeeding to the office and regalia of an arch-druid, and that he slew his predecessor is not unlikely if we compare the following account of Caesar of how the arch-druids were elected. Overall, these druids one presides, who possesses supreme authority among them. Upon his death, if any individual among the rest is preeminent in dignity, he succeeds, but if there are many equal, the election is made by the suffrages of the Druids. Sometimes they even contend for the presidency with arms. These assemble at a fixed period of the year in a consecrated place in the territories of the Carnutes. These assemble at a fixed period of the year in a consecrated place in the territories of the Carnutes, which is reckoned the central region of the whole of Gaul. Hither all who have disputes assemble from every part and submit to their decrees and, de and submit to their decrees and determinations. This institution is supposed to have been devised in Britain and to have been brought over from it into Gaul. And now those who desire to gain a more accurate knowledge of that system generally proceed thither for the purpose of studying it. Gallic War, Book 6, Chapter 14. We come now to the bird which was born from this egg of the golden serpent or lindworm. Herodotus is the first to describe the phoenix. Herodotus, Book 2, Chapter 73. He says that it was sacred and that it was very rare even in Egypt before it came to Heliopolis, or on the city of the sun, only once in 500 years. The 500 years allotted to the phoenix in the Indian eagle Garuda has an important significance, for the Egyptians who invented the calendar had not perfected their calculations of the solar year. As time went on, therefore, the rising of the dog star Sothis, or Sirius, which heralded the annual flooding of the Nile, did not coincide with the month originally dedicated to it. Therefore, every 500 years, the calendar was readjusted. And this was known as the Great or Sothic Year, and was celebrated with high festival. The phoenix, who returned periodically to the Sun Temple, or Garuda, whose egg took 500 years to hatch, is therefore the eagle-headed sun god returning to his allotted point in the calendar. Herodotus says that the bird was reputed to be partly red, partly gold, and shaped exactly like an eagle, that it was supposed to come all the way from Arabia, bringing the dead parent bird with it. To do this, it first formed a ball of myrrh, and then hollowed out the ball and put the parent inside it. Then it flew with the ball to the temple. He makes no mention of the phoenix being born again from this ball, probably because he took it for granted that this was common knowledge. But both Lactantius and the anonymous Saxon poet who wrote a poem about the phoenix in the book of Exeter recount that the fabulous bird was born again from its own egg, placed in the fire, which became in turn first a worm, i.e. the lindworm, and then the phoenix. Yet after the appointed time, new life again returneth to it, when the ashes once again begin after the flame's force to combine together shrunk up into a ball. After the Saxon poet goes on, then after that conflagration, an apple's likeness will be found once more amid the ashes. This ball or apple found amidst the ashes is reminiscent of the crystal in the Orphic Book of Stones, but even more so of the stone balls found in the ashes of the perpetual fire at Bath in Britain. Here was kept a perpetual fire to the goddess, whom the Romans called Minerva, but who was known to the British and Irish as Brigitte daughter of the Dagda. 
and who had two sisters also called Bridget. Salinas, who wrote a kind of Baedeker's Guide to the, uh, of the Known World in the 3rd century, states, The whole circuit of Britain is 4,875 miles, in which space are great in many rivers and hot baths, finally kept to the use of men, the sovereign of which baths is that of the goddess Minerva, in whose chapel the fire burneth continually, and the coals do never turn into ashes, but as soon as the embers are dead, it turned into balls of stone. Said ubi ignis tabuet vertit in globos saxios. It must be remembered that Wolfram in his Parzival expressly states that the grail is a stone from which the phoenix rises. Both de Boron and Lonelick describe this phoenix in an adventure wherein King Evelac or Mordrains is left alone, hungry and thirsty upon a desert island. The king is tempted to eat a loaf of black bread, provided by demonic powers, but a marvelous bird swoops down and knocks it from his hand. The history of the bird is then given and agrees closely with the account in the Book of Exeter. Because of its powers of regeneration, Evelok is told that he may accept it as a type or symbol of Christ. It is born from a stone found in the Vale of Hebron near Jerusalem. A precious stone of marvelous kind, wet in the Vale of Ibron, is at all days. And de Boron states that the female or mother, est apile, sur polions, et la pierre de quoi elle se art, est apile, piratiste, that is to say, the fire stone. The connection of this fire stone with the Vale of Hebron should be noted. For this tallies with the assertion that the ritual of the fiery stone was spread by Solomon. It is a fact that the story of the renewal of the eagle's life spread from Heliopolis in Egypt to all the countries of Europe. We find the Welsh sun god Lu is changed while he has one foot in the magic cauldron into an eagle, who after a year has lost most of his plumage and sits dejectedly on a tree, until at last he is restored to his old shape. Similarly, Psalm 103, Thy youth is renewed like the eagles, shows that the myth was known amongst the Jews. Opinions are divided as to whether the words phoenix and the people of the phoenix, known as the Phoenicians, are derived from the word for palm tree or for red. Were the men of Tyre and Sidon, it is asked, known as the redskins from their complexions or from the palm trees which grew on their coasts? In my view, both derivations are probably correct, and both reasons wrong. The word red was used by ancient man to denote the mysterious thing which we know as fire. It was the red thing, and the Phoenicians were a people devoted to the cult of this red thing. And it is furthermore possible that the palm tree was their brand stock, as the oak was in Europe. There is a very touching description in Lonelick's version of the Grand St. Graal, of how Nashens takes the scabbard, or the brand, in his hand, and cannot understand of what it is made. The quest tells us that it is made from the tree of life, but this refers to the wood, whereas Nashens is puzzled by the actual flames. But well he wist it was also red, and as only red rose in that stead. But alas, he never discovers what it is made of, nor did any man until the days of Lavoisier. In all the legends in this book, therefore, the word fire should be substituted for red. As evidence of this, plate 3 shows a charm stone which has been in the possession of Major John Stewart, which has been in the possession of Major John Stewart of Ardverlich's family since the 14th century, and probably much longer. It is reputed to have great healing powers and was used to cure the diseases of cattle until comparatively recent times. It is of pure white rock crystal set in silver, but has nevertheless been known throughout history as the Plaque d'Erg, or the Red Stone. The flint bags of the Breton Corrigans were red bags. The Red Knight, whom Parsifal slays, is the divine youth who carries fire, whose place and office, his red armor, Percival takes. Galahad is similarly clothed in red armor. Mithras also is traditionally cloaked in red. Of the Egyptian god Osiris, Plutarch says that they dress his statue in a flame-colored robe, since they consider the sun as body of the power of the good. 
as it were, a visible sign of an essence that mind only can conceive. Plutarch on Isis and Osiris. The author of Ye Saint Graal says of this in so many words, For as the Lord came to his disciples in the form of fire, so the knight Galahad came to you in red arms, which may be likened to the fire. And as Jesus Christ came to his disciples, the doors being shut upon them, so the knight came to you also to the hall that was shut, without anyone knowing what way he came in. E. St. Graal, 469. The analogy of the Welsh writer remains good, for we still do not know how light traverses space to arrive into our atmosphere, any more than we are able to understand how Christ was able to transcend time and space after the resurrection. To return now to the clock de Erg, it is easily understood that this firestone, which was called the red stone, was later confused in legend with rubies, carbuncles, and the like. Pliny, describing precious stones, groups nearly all red-colored gems, whether rubies, garnets, red amethysts, or spinella rubies, under the one heading of carbuncle. It is not surprising, therefore, that a legend exists to the effect that the sand real was made from one great ruby. While the earth was still void, Satan led the rebel angels against the throne of God. In his crest was a shining ruby, the rallying point of all his soldiers. This ruby St. Michael smote out with his flaming sword. It fell to earth, and the sea folk, perhaps the Cretans or Phoenicians, fashioned of it a wondrous cup, which Solomon caused to be brought to him. When Solomon died, no one knew of its fate until his greater son used that cup in which to institute his sacrament. This legend is given by Rev. C. L. Marson in his book Glastonbury, or the English Jerusalem, page 7, published by Simpkin Marshall, 1909. The author does not quote his source, and I should be grateful to have it pointed out to me. It is presumable that Mr. Marson drew from some old manuscript or persisting legend. It is interesting to note that once again Solomon is associated with the holy vessel. Gawain, when he went to Monteclair, Gawain, when he went to Monteclair to fetch the sword of Judas Maccabeus, entered a richly adorned grotto which was lighted by one great carbuncle fixed in a central pillar. From this pillar hung the sword. See the legend of Sir Percival by Jesse Weston, page 224. In the stories which will be given presently, the reader will be able to recognize such a carbuncle in the hilt of a sword, or in the jewelry of a fairy queen for the fire stone or crystal, the clack de erg. So much for the phoenix and its egg. We have already touched on the question of the glass sphere being compared to a ship. In several languages, a vessel can have the double interpretation of a sea-going bark or a receptacle for liquids. Perhaps the reason for this lies in the fact that the earliest boats to navigate the Euphrates, as we know from engravings of them, were very like hollowed gourds or the modern goldfish bowl. The Arabs still use these kufas today on the Euphrates, and the ancient type, figure 7, can be compared with the modern plate 4. Ancient kufa from Professor Maspero's Dawn of Civilization. An Arab crossing the Tigris in a modern Kufa, from Professor Maspero's Dawn of Civilization. If such a Kufa were to be made in glass, it would be nearly as efficient as the laboratory retort for the focusing of sun rays. In Egypt, the sun was supposed to sail in a ship across the sky. The sun itself was the eye of Ra, or Horus, and he had but the one, for he had lost the other in a battle with the powers of evil, or Typhon. This is worth noting, for later we shall find Odin, like Horus, was one-eyed, having sacrificed the other as the price for obtaining wisdom. The solar eye in its Egyptian ship is found depicted in many parts of northern Europe. See figure 8. Egyptian bark with figure of Ra holding an unk enclosed in solar disk. 19th Dynasty, British Museum. Egyptian solar bark, 22nd Dynasty, British Museum. Ship carving with the solar emblem from Scania, Sweden, after Du Shailu. Solar ship with sail from New Grange, Ireland. Solar ship from Loch Maryacre, Brittany, after Ferguson. 
the Egyptian solar bark depicted in Northern Europe, from Myths and Legends of the Celtic Race by T. W. Rolleston. A replica of this solar bark, which through time became more and more like a chest, was carried by the Egyptians in their processions in much the same way as the Israelites carried the Ark of the Covenant. It was the ashen chest in which the Trojan Edun kept her apple. And in the north, the prow of such a ship had a figurehead representing a swan-like bird. In the Grand St. Réal, Nations sees Solomon's ship approaching the distance. A little thing him thou he say come in here, no more than a swan as thou it were, lonely. In the prose, Percival, the ship is guided by an old bald-headed man. Percival is asleep therein, and at his feet is a candlestick. In the Conte of Christiane, the ship is drawn by a swan, and within it is a blade, which must be drawn out within a year from the body of a prince, who is the son of a fairy. C. M. Potvin's Printing of the Prose Percival in Christian's Conti, page 142 in Book 3, pages 24 through 7 and 56. The swan ship is therefore the processional chest in which the sacra of the mysteries are kept, and must be distinguished from the holy vessel, crystal, or urim, which is kept in the chest. It is time now that we turned to examine the writing of a certain Greek, whose records are essential to a student of Grail legend. Athenaeus, being a great lover of wine, purports in his Diapnosophiste to give the history of all the various types of drinking cup known both past and present, being something of a bon viveur, and without much interest in the mysteries, he does not always distinguish between what were originally very sacred vessels and the utilitarian tableware of his own day. No doubt, the names of these sacred vessels did pass to common drinking cups in much the same way as the corn goddess Ceres gave her name to our modern breakfast cereals. But Athenaeus, like the majority of people of all times, was more interested in what was on the breakfast table than in ancient history. Nevertheless, he does attempt to go into the mythological origins of some of the vessels he describes. First, he tells of how the sun descended into its golden cup and was born to the land of the Hesperides, then of how Heracles carried off this cup and sailed across Oceanus. Whether this is the solar bark itself or the glass sphere through which it was incarnated on earth in the form of fire is uncertain, but I incline to the latter view. A hollow glass sphere must, of course, be filled with water before it will focus the sun's rays. Athenaeus tells of a maiden who had been cast into the sea. A man dives from a ship to rescue her and emerges with a cup made of gold, so marvelous that the gold he already had, when compared with it, was no better than copper, an apt way of differentiating between metal and the glory of sunlight on glass. Athenaeus speaks of the cup of Bathycles, but here Plutarch is more explicit. See Plutarch's Life of Solon, translated by A. H. Clough, page 171. It was drawn up by a fisherman in a net from the sea, as Danae was drawn up by Dictus, and the Pythian oracle declared that it should be the prize of the wisest man in Greece. After some dispute, it was finally kept at Delphi, and was later confused with the tripod, which was another sacred relic kept in the same temple. It is interesting to note here that this offering of a golden tripod or table to the Temple of Apollo at Delphi was taken in the Middle Ages to be a type of presentation of the pure virgin in the Temple of God. When the glaciers made the windows for King's College Chapel, Cambridge, in the early 16th century, it was stipulated that the subjects should represent the story of the old law and of the new law, the former in a row of windows above to be typical of those of the New Testament below the crossbar. Nothing from Old Testament history would equate with the presentation of the Virgin Mary, so the scene of the offering to Delphi was introduced, the only scene from pagan history in the long series of biblical scenes. The glaciers depicted the offering as a golden table, but Plutarch says that although it was commonly held to be the tripod scene at Delphi, some versions of the tale held that it was a bowl or beaker. The De Hypnosophiste goes on to give the history of cups of this silex type, 
They were roughly the shape of our modern concave reflector for an arc lamp. Heracles, the solar hero, drank from one, and it was sometimes called the Thericlean Cyclix, because the skins of wild beasts were figured on it. It was called the instrument of Zeus the Savior. The Greek writer speaks also of another type of vessel named a cantheros, a lamp maker, so called, he presumes, from the lamp maker who first made one. He says that it was like a ship, and it was sometimes called a swan, and on it was figured a die staff and a serpent. He asserts that the silex took its name from the wheel, not, I think, the potter's wheel, but from St. Catherine's, for it was a cup which came to a point, or foxos, and he says it took its name from the place where it was kept. He tells us that the cup bone of the hip, which we know is the acetabulum, and into which the ball of the femur fits, was also called the silex from its shape being that of a shallow cup. This is important, for here is the possible origin of confusion between the reflecting bowl being struck by the sun spear and a man's thigh being wounded by a weapon. Let us go back to the ship of glass in Celtic myth. The Welsh bards describe a ceremony wherein a ship is carried in procession. It is the ship of a god called Hugh, or H-U, who was in Christian times thought to be a Celtic synonym for the Atlantean Noah because he escaped the great flood in his ship. But in truth, Hugh was only a Welsh variant of the name of the sun god in his special character of what we Christians would call the third person of the Trinity, and the Jews designate the Shekinah, or Radiance, being neither the sun nor the incarnate flame, but the light which proceeds from both. I have heard it suggested that the name derives from the Sanskrit to pour out, and that Hugh is he who is poured out, who Saris was one of the names by which the Greeks knew the Egyptian man-god Osiris. See Plutarch on Isis and Osiris, 34. To whom, presumably, a measure of the Holy Spirit was vouchsafed. The idea of the pouring out of the Holy Spirit is familiar to the Hebrew prophets from Isaiah to Joel, who prophecies that at the last God will pour out his Spirit, not upon the few initiates only, but upon all flesh. The Welsh bard Rhys Bearded wrote of the god Hugh thus, The smallest of the small is Hugh, the mighty in the world's judgment, yet he is the greatest, the Lord over us, we sincerely believe, and our god of mystery. Light is his course, and swift, a particle of lucid sunshine is his car. Quoted from the translation of Mr. Edward Davies in Mythology and Rites of the British Druids, page 10. Mr. Dudley Wright gives an account of the procession of Hugh's Ark, in Druidism by Dudley Wright, in which the first Arephant represented the Creator, the second carried a torch, and the third represented the moon. That is to say, he probably carried the moon goblet, for, as will presently be shown, the moon's powers of reflection were understood, and she was venerated not for her own properties, but as the giant reflecting cauldron of the sun in the heavens. In this procession of Hugh's sacra, the ark is probably the chest, visible to all, while the holy vessel or moon goblet would have been veiled. Merlin, who was quite possibly a real character at Arthur's court, took his name at least, if not his identity, from the much more ancient Merdin another title for the sun god whose goddess wife, Ellen, built a glass castle to imprison her lord. Minor Traditions of British Mythology by Lewis Spence. Merlin, it is also recorded, constructed a house of glass in which he went to sea, sailing to Bardsey and taking with him the thirteen wonderful treasures of Britain. See Lady Charlotte Guest's Mabinogian, the note on page 115 of volume 1. The hermetic vase or vase of the alchemists, when hermetically sealed, that is to say, when the neck of the spherical glass was melted and closed, was known as the house of glass or prison of the king, the king being a periphrasis amongst the alchemists for the philosopher's stone. Prelude to Chemistry by Professor J. Reed, page 150. Originally, the king must have signified sunlight caught in glass, the following is from Spencer's Fairy Queen, 
in the connection of the glass globe with Merlin made, and the Egyptian Ptolemy or Ptolemies of Grail legend is to be noted. Also the fact that it was a looking glass for the seer who peered into it seeking visions. In Dehubarth, that now South Wales is height, what time King Ryance reigned and dealed might. A looking glass right wondrously aguised, whose virtues through the wide world soon were solemnized. In virtue had to show in perfect sight whatever thing was in the world contained, betwixt the lowest earth and heaven's height, so that it to the looker appertained, whatever foe had wrought or friend had feigned, therein discovered was, nay aught mote pass, nay aught in secret form the same remained, for thy it round and hollow shaped was, like to the world itself and seemed a world of glass, who wonders not that reads so wondrous work. But who does wonder that has read the tower wherein the Egyptian Pharaoh, or Pharaoh, Lon did look from all men who out of her bower, great Ptolemy for it his Leman's sake, he builded all of glass by magic power, and also it impregnable did make, yet when his love was false, he with the peas it break. Such was the glassy globe that Merlin made and gave now unto Ryance for his guard. The Reverend W. Gunn, in his preface to his translation of Nennius's History of Britain, discusses the question of the sacred glass ark, the possession of which distinguished the initiate from the uninitiate, and mentions the legend of Alexander the Great, having been let down into the sea in a glass vessel, and then drawn up again. This brings us to the very important question of what is the true significance of the story of man's being drawn out of the water in an ark. The divine double of Pharaoh, the immortal twin, is the fire passing through water in the form of light, and drawn out from the glass ark to ignite the fiery brand, even as Arthur drew Excalibur from the Lady of the Lake. Therefore, to say that a man has been thus drawn from an ark and water is to say that he has received genius, undergone spiritual rebirth, become an Illuminatus, been consecrated as a son of the sun. Amongst many legends of children being found in an ark floating on water, I give the following examples, and it will not be surprising if the ark is described to the uninitiate as being made of wickerwork, reeds, or bulrushes, like the Kufa illustrated on plate 4. In India, Karna, a hero of the Mahabharata, is begotten of the sun god and brought forth by the princess Pritha, who, to hide her shame, consigns him to the water in an ark of wicker work. Here it is specifically mentioned that the father is the sun god. The infant Sargon, afterwards a famous king of Babylon who lived about 2500 BC, is put by his mother into such an ark and is drawn up from the Euphrates by Aki, the gardener. See The Ancient World by J. A. Brendan, page 42. The infant Perseus and his mother Danae are set adrift in a chest and drawn up by Dictus, the fisherman king. Romulus and Remus, the immortal and mortal twins, born of the vestal virgin Sylvia, are drawn out of a similar vessel. Gawain, the hawk-like hero of Grail legend, was likewise placed by Anna in an ark and rescued by a shepherd. Horus, the infant sun god of Egypt, is frequently figured as a child with finger to lip to signify infancy by the babyish habit of thumb-sucking, rising from the cup or calyx of the lotus, the lily cup or arc of bulrushes of which more will be heard presently. An illustration will be found on plate 5. I will reserve the story of the Welsh Taliesin of Lancelot and of Moses for another chapter. Remembering Pliny's description of how the serpent's egg would float, even though set in gold, we come now to the legend of the floating stones. In Brittany, the people will recount today how the greater number of their local saints arrived from Britain, miraculously navigating a floating stone. At first, the picture conjured up is of a venerable old man paddling a monstrous megalith across the channel. But, like all traditions, there is truth in the words if they are properly interpreted. In the quest and in E. St. Graal, Arthur's knights discovered a floating stone of red marble. 
Here, Walter Mapp evidently used his imagination too freely in translating Clock de Erg. Lord, says the squire who first saw it, I have seen a wonderful thing, a stone floating in the stream above the water. And the tale goes on. And in the stone there was, as they thought, an honorable sword. Its pommel was of precious stone. Et estois le poins du ene Pierre Presways, Pierre Precieuse. There was lettering on the hilt, which again bears out the tradition that some engraving of characters was figured on the gold setting of the grail stone. The only knight who could draw the sword from this floating stone was the hawk-like Galahad, son of Elaine, who is none other than the goddess Ellen, the virgin glass sphere which imprisoned the sunbeam of Merdin. The Druids, and perhaps even early Christian saints, probably took such floating stones with them when they went to spread their teaching in Brittany. Chapter 4, The Irreconcilables of a Study of Two Worlds, or Persephone. The Dichotomy of the Sphere. No orchids is the record of an expedition beyond the barrier into the world of the other side, and the predominant characteristic of that world is that it is devastated by the bitter conflict of two rival factions. The conflict is not at first conspicuous, for the earlier episodes of the story are concerned mainly with the abduction of Miss Blandish. It is true that that at once leads to a conflict, but at first it is only the enmity between two gangs with which we are concerned. But as the story progresses, and the writer penetrates more deeply into the hinterland of the other side, the dichotomy crystallizes out into the opposition of two clearly defined parties, each representing definite principles. They are the upper world of John Blandish and the underworld of Ma Grissom. Once these two characters emerge, the conflict assumes larger proportions and eventually envelops the whole scene. It reaches its climax in the pitched battle between the Blandish police army in the Grissom gang, in which the latter's stronghold is taken by storm. The situation we have seen has its mythological prototype in the Persephone myth, in which the princess of the upper world is also ravished by the ruler of the underworld. And we can now discern another parallel, the story of the rape of Helen in the Trojan War. The plot may therefore be regarded as archetypal, that is to say, as representing a fundamental mental pattern, and we have now to attempt to discover in what this schism of the mind consists. Attention has already been drawn to the way in which uh, the theme of dichotomy pervades the book. Not only is it manifested in the conflict between the opposing factions for the possession of Miss Blandish, but also in the division between this world and the other side. It is, however, important to appreciate that these two cleavages are not identical. The two halves into which each of them divides the totality of the world of the mind are not the same. This point is of vital importance in the study of the mind, and failure to appreciate it has led to many misconceptions. It can be best illustrated by the analogy of the sphere. Parmenides envisaged the totality of all things the ent, or essence, of being, which is imperishable, whole, indivisible, continuous, unchangeable, perfect, and evenly extended in every direction, therefore a sphere. In the form of a sphere, and this image is of great and far-reaching importance, the sphere is the only body which appears the same from every point of view. No point on its surface is inherently distinguishable from any other point and it is the body which contains the largest volume for a given superficies. Regarded as a container, it holds the maximum possible content. For these reasons, it has always been the symbol of perfection and completion, for however one looks at it, it remains the same. No part of it has greater significance or importance than any other, as, for instance, the apex of a cone has and its content cannot be increased by any change of shape. It is the essence of wholeness. As a result of these properties, it is possible to divide a sphere into halves along an infinite number of planes, and the result will always be the same. 
we obtain two hemispheres similar in every respect to one another, and also exactly similar to the hemispheres resulting from bisection along any other plane. This is the position in its purest and most absolute form. It suggests that in whatever we may divide the totality of being, or as we say nowadays, of experience, we shall obtain basically the same result. That is to say, two halves which are fundamentally interchangeable and which are always capable of reunification into the same perfect whole. We may, for our own purposes, differentiate between the two hemispheres by coloring one of them red and the other blue, but such a distinction is superficial, arbitrary, and fundamentally irrelevant. Ultimately, on the highest plane where such accidentals are of no account, we are left with two perfect halves, indistinguishable from one another, and whose only characteristic is that they are halves of the perfect whole. The image is strikingly expressed in the famous passage on the origin of sexual love in Plato's Symposium. Aristophanes describes the original human being as follows. Secondly, the shape of each human being was wholly in the round, with circular back, circular sides, four hands, four legs, circular neck, and one head with two faces looking opposite ways, four ears, double genitals, and everything my description implies. Freemasons may recognize something in this description. Jove then bisected each being as men slice apples for pickling or cut eggs with a hair, turning the faces and subsequently the genitals to the inner side of the resulting hemispherical beings. The consequence was as follows. Now when their natural state had been bisected, each half yearned for and tried to approach the other. Round each other, they threw their arms, entwining themselves in their desire to fuse. As our study progresses, we shall find the significance of this symbolism confirmed in one example after another. I may anticipate by here saying that the figure of a single human being divided vertically each half revealing the characteristics of one of the sexes, and with two heads or two faces on one head, is the conventional image of rebus, the double thing of medieval alchemy. The basic meaning of this picture is the division of the original perfect whole into two corresponding halves, the opposites, resulting in the desire for reunion between the halves which arises from the actual incompleteness of each in itself, and from the ever-present potential completeness which consists of the union between the two. The union of the sexes is preeminently the symbol of this union between opposites, which are at the same time counterparts of one another. Their union results, of course, in restoring the original unity in the form of the child. We are dealing here with the figure of the mind, not with a mere allegory of the facts of biology. If regarded in the latter light, the parable would be merely silly. The appearance of the sphere, in any case, denotes that there is more in it than that. This is only a single particular case of the general principle of dichotomy in which, instead of coloring our two hemispheres red and blue, we have named them male and female. And, incidentally, Plato maintains that there were originally three sexes, double males, double females, and androgynes. Heterosexual love is the attraction between the two halves of an androgyne, but the bisection of the other two produces male and female homosexuality. In other words, we have here a statement that the two halves are really indistinguishable. That union with the counterpart is in the last resort the subject's union with himself seen from a different viewpoint. If the subject identifies himself with maleness, then he necessarily has a counterpart which appears as female. But it is perfectly possible, as we shall see later, for him to identify himself with femaleness or with the androgyne instead. The trouble about this wholeness seen as the sphere, as an object of thought, is that its parts are all distinguishable from one another and its form invariable from whatever point of view we regard it. We can think of it only as an undifferentiated whole, and beyond that point we can make no progress. But in order to live, we must see the world as something distinct from ourselves, with which we can establish relationships. 
and here already we have a dichotomy consisting in the division of totality into the hemispheres of subject and object, or self and not self. With the implications of this differentiation we shall be concerned later. Again, in order to understand life, we must endow objects of our experience with individuality, seeing them as identities over against the remainder, which is everything else, but not the identity in question. Proceeding further, we discover similarities and dissimilarities between the various identities which we have established. One class is living, the other inanimate, one pleasant, the other unpleasant, and so on. Here we have further dichotomies into classes or categories, each consisting of a pair of opposites. The functioning of the conscious mind, in fact, consists basically in discrimination, which means the dichotomy of the totality of experience, or being as it presents itself to us, into pairs of opposites, each of which implies its counterpart. With this theme we shall also be concerned later. It is sufficient for the moment to indicate that conscious life may be symbolized as a continuous series of bisections of the perfect sphere which lies beyond and behind all appearances, and which contains all possibilities in an undifferentiated state within itself. The result of carrying out this process over a period of years may be visualized in the image of a private reproduction of the absolute universal sphere, and this is the personal mental world of the individual in question. This replica, however, differs from its universal prototype, in that the individual has made it incomprehensible to his own perceptions by arbitrarily identifying points on its surface and establishing their relations to one another. The result is something like a terrestrial globe, the uniform surface of which is marked off by lines of longitude and latitude, and covered with a complex pattern of identifiable areas. It is now no longer immaterial from what point of view the sphere is regarded, nor along which plane it is bisected. Each bisection, although still producing two hemispheres of identical form, which retain the property of potential reunion to re-establish the perfect whole, is characterized by the different marked areas which are separated by it. To take the terrestrial globe as an example, if we bisect it along the equator, we obtain the conventional northern and southern hemispheres, the peninsula of India being contained in the former. If, however, we tilt the plane of bisection through some 20 degrees, so that the point of the line of cleavage nearest the North Pole is on the same longitude as India, the latter area will now be included in the hemisphere containing the South Pole. The two new hemispheres differ very little from the former two, and may still reasonably be designated northern and southern, but the slight difference in the plane of bisection has resulted in the transference of an important area from one to the other. In the mental world, such a transference may be exemplified by a man's attitude to, say, his own body. Seen from certain points of view, it is part of the hemisphere of self as opposed to that of not-self. But if the viewpoint is only slightly changed, it becomes part of the outer world from which the subject, seeing itself as a mind, is separate. Thus, an athlete, while training for a race, is treating his body as something external to himself, on which he is working very much as he might, on a horse which he was preparing for the same purpose. During the actual race, however, his viewpoint changes and he is identified with his body, which becomes part of himself as contrasted with his competitors. He now no longer stands over against it as an object, deciding that this will be beneficial for it and the other harmful but is identified with it in the effect which mind and body are making in unison. Sir Winston Churchill brings out this point in a passage in World Crisis, in which he says that a horseman should train his horse as though it were worth 10,000 pounds, and ride it as though it were worth half a crown, an analogy which he applies to the utilization of military and the naval forces in war. Failure to understand this matter leads to false identifications. Thus, if we divide the sphere of totality into male and female, and again into positive and negative, the resultant hemispheres are very similar but not identical. Failure to appreciate the difference leads to such false assertions as that the masculine is positive 
in the feminine negative. As an approximation, this statement may be serviceable, but it is no more strictly true than would be the assertion that the feminine was beautiful and the masculine ugly, the former dark and the latter bright, or true and false, heavy and light, or any other irrelevant pair of opposites. We have to guard against the tendency to pick out one particular line of bisection and to attempt to understand everything in its terms. Philosophers particularly are liable to attempt to force the whole of existence into such procrustean beds. Each dichotomy is individual and unique, and the resultant pair of opposites differs, however slightly, from every other pair. Only the fact of dichotomy itself, and its specific and irreducible implications, are universally valid. These are the production of a pair of opposites which are the counterparts of one another. Between them there is tension which itself consists at one and the same time of the opposites of repulsion and attraction, hatred and love, and finally the opposites inherently contain the potentiality of fruitful reunion. In No Orchids, the sense of duality which pervades the story represents the principle of dichotomy and the resultant tension in general, but the two forms in which we have so far found it expressed represent two distinct cleavages. That between this world and the other side represents the division between the two modes of the mind, the personal and the universal or generic respectively. That between the factions of John Blandish and Ma Grissom, on the other hand, is the conflict between the principles of constituted authority and the rebellion of the dispossessed. We may now turn for further information on the subject to the persons of the two leaders of the factions, who are the representatives of the principles concerned. The cause of the conflict. We have already noted that both Blandish and Ma make their first appearances as disembodied voices on the telephone. This reveals that they reside in the further reaches of the other side. They are not immediately perceptible although they are always present in the background. Furthermore, we have seen that once they appear, the latent conflict, which has been in the air from the start, flares up and involves everybody. Even the empty-headed blonde is compelled to take sides. Here again, we have the symbolic representation of an important characteristic of the mind. The process of differentiation by bisection of the sphere is essentially a working of the conscious mind. In the collective or universal part of the unconscious mind, the nature of which we shall consider later, the process of discrimination has not yet been applied. Its contents, therefore, exist in a state of undifferentiated potentiality, in which the opposites have not yet been separated out, and the tension between them has not therefore come into existence. It is only when any such content reaches the conscious mind that the latter seeks to make it intelligible by splitting it up into pairs of opposites. Thus, there exist in the mind two departments, or areas, or modes of functioning, in one of which everything is, so to speak, unitary, not yet being seen in the light of polarities, self, not self, subject, object, particular, universal, good, bad, inner, outer, spirit, matter, and so forth. Whereas in the other, everything is so seen, and is thereby allotted a place in the personal scheme of ideas and values. This dichotomy has always been known to mystical thinkers. This dichotomy has always been known to mystical thinkers, and is symbolized in the Tau cross, or T. This figure indicates that the area above the horizontal line is undivided, whereas that below is bisected by the vertical line into the pairs of opposites. The horizontal is the barrier. Another version is to be found in the ancient Egyptian Ankh. Here, the loop at the top is a distorted circle, signifying the sphere of undifferentiated totality. The figure appears again in the astrological symbol for Venus, the circle and the cross. Mental progress is achieved by raising contents from the undifferentiated area into the light of consciousness thereby assimilating them into the personal world picture or personality, and subjecting them to the control of the ego. In this last analogy, the undifferentiated area is seen as lying below that of consciousness. It is the universal or collective unconsciousness 
seen as the sea, the mother of all things, the contents of which are captured and brought up into the light by the function of intuition, just as the fisherman catches and lands fishes. With the symbol of the fisherman we shall be concerned again. The three symbols illustrated above, on the other hand, show the undifferentiated area lying above the differentiated. There it is regarded as the realm of spirit, from which divine inspirations and revelations descend into the world below. The difference is only one of viewpoint. As we shall see later, the admission of contents to consciousness is controlled by a selective mechanism, its unconscious, which has been built up by the individual and arbitrarily so constituted that it excludes whole categories of experience from consciousness. We cannot go further into the matter at this point, but any reader of maturer years will probably be able to remember how in the course of his life the area of his consciousness has from time to time expanded, revealing to him whole departments of mental experience of which he has hitherto been completely unaware. It may have been music or other people's feelings, speculative thought, speculative thought, religious experience, or something more concrete, such as the delights of gardening, the refinements of cooking, the joy of possessing exceptional or beautiful objects, or the practice of some art or handicraft. Looking back, it is hard to realize how one had hitherto lived in total ignorance of all the richness of experience and the living implications of one's discovery, how all awareness of them had apparently been withheld from the mind without one's knowledge or consent. These are cases of spontaneous and felicitous adaptations to the mind's inherent tendency to expand the area of consciousness by assimilating contents of the unconscious. Cases, however, often arise in which the conscious attitude opposes obstinate resistance to such assimilations. The reason for this will appear later. For the present, we must be content to accept the fact that the situation occurs and that the result is an internal conflict between the principle of the selection of conscious contents and the class of content thereby denied admission. It is as though a doorkeeper who had received orders to exclude all candidates for admission having certain characteristics were fighting with an indignant mob of such people clamoring to be let in. The doorkeeper and the authority which has issued the orders which he obeys, in other words, the mechanism governing the admission of contents to consciousness, are themselves unknown to the conscious mind. The conflict, in fact, is taking place wholly in the unconscious. The conscious mind is not aware of the existence of a conflict, for the latter exists only in a latent or potential condition, only becoming manifest in the state of tension and exhaustion which it produces. Here we have the explanation of that atmosphere of depression and drained vitality which we have noted, and which provides the incentive for the venture into the hinterland beyond the barrier, in search of the treasure of renewed life, energy, and decisiveness which has disappeared into it. Such a penetration of the barrier implies the direction of the light of conscious discrimination into dark regions normally inaccessible to it, and the effect of such illumination is that the opposites, hitherto concealed in the unconscious, immediately become apparent and fly apart. All the latent tensions and hostilities inherent in the situation flare up and become actual, leading to a savage battle in the conscious mind. Such penetrations of the barrier, therefore, are dynamic and often agonizing experiences, they are also dangerous, and that is the basis of the theme of the forbidden door in the fairy tales. Familiar in Germanic folklore, an example taken at random from a remoter world is to be found in the tale of the second Kilandar from the Arabian Nights. The hero always opens it, thereby falling into great danger and suffering, but he sometimes succeeds in securing the treasure. For if the conscious mind is strong and adaptable enough to retain its identity and sense of orientation in the midst of the turmoil of the great forces which it has unleashed, their confrontation and coming to grips with one another acts as a discharge of tension. Even if the treasure is not secured and slips back, like Eurydice from Orpheus's arms, into the darkness, 
there is at least temporary relief from the long-drawn devitalization of suppressed conflict. Something has been achieved in the uprush of repressed forces, and it often takes the form of a creative work. If, however, the conscious mind fails to contain and master the powerful forces which erupt into it from the unconscious, some form of personal catastrophe ensues. The subject becomes possessed by blind forces which usurp the control of the conscious will, and he is either drawn to symbolical and ultimately self-destructive actions, or succumbs to suicide, neurosis, or at best, neurotic collapse. Creative work is a dangerous activity, but needs must when the devil drives. Father and Mother John Blandish and Maud Grissom are the remote focal points of the two opposing factions. It is noticeable that they never meet. They never even encroach on one another's territories. For Ma, throughout the story, never leaves her premises. And when Blandish wishes to join in the pursuit of his uh, fugitive daughter and her lover, he is turned back by Fenner. Both are archetypal figures. Blandish is the king, for the local millionaire in the world of no orchids is no less and he is specifically described as the meat king, and essentially the father. Ma is no less a queen, for she has carved out a kingdom for herself in the underworld. She has created the gang which controls it. The Grissom mob was the most vicious murder machine in the state. Ma had built it up, and she was proud of it. And of course, she is essentially the mother, the mother of Slim, the villain hero. We do not see very much of Blandish, personally, but throughout the story, we are aware of his authority. Right from the start, it is him that the gangsters are afraid. For the police are no more than his agents. He, the gangster, began to realize that his job was going to be big. He could imagine how tough Blandish would get with the cops. Or, if we rub her out, her old man will spend every cent to catch up with us. The amount of heat that old guy could dig up would make us dizzy and Blandish himself is implacable in his hatred of the underworld. I think my daughter is dead, Blandish said quietly. I hope she is, otherwise. And immediately afterwards, I want those men caught. I don't want them to get away with this. I should be more satisfied if they were killed than arrested. His daughter's honor, that is to say, his own honor, is dearer to him than her life. But his hatred of the underworld is the strongest motive of all. In his person, Blandish represents the grim world of the industrial West. Its moral virtues are those of the godly, righteous, and sober life. Industry, respectability, purity, toughness, and a shrewd common sense. We see it all expressed in his portrait. Just above middle height, a thin face, clean-shaven, and heavy jaw. His eyes gave his face its extraordinary power and character. Deep set in dank sockets, they were hard, shrewd, and vital. One imagines him dressed in rusty black, a Bible under his arm, the personification of sour Puritan intolerance. Ma resembles him in many respects. Grim, unscrupulous, authoritative, determined, and power-loving, she is his replica. Only in the activities they favor are they dramatically diametrically opposed, for Blandish represents respectability, chastity, and orderliness, whereas Ma cultivates licentiousness, lawlessness, and all the vices. Some of these characteristics are not revealed in their own person, but in those of their minions. Fenner, for instance, displays orderliness and chastity, for he has an office in which he sits during the conventional hours, whether he has anything to do or not, occupying himself with repulsing the advances made by Paula, his glamorous secretary. On one occasion, he explicitly declines to make love to her during office hours. This chastity of Fenner's is important. We have seen that it enables him to stride past the barrier in the nightclub without succumbing to the blandishments of the blonde who guards it. He is the one character who is free of both worlds, it being explained that in his previous career as a journalist, he got to know all about the hoodlums. He has the right of entry, which Blandish and the police have not, but he can enter freely only when he goes alone. As soon as he comes accompanied by the police army, the underworld resists, and although the resistance is eventually overcome, the effort, as we have seen, is fruitless. 
for when the victors at last penetrate to the innermost citadel, they find that Miss Blandish, the treasure, is no longer there. Nevertheless, by his impregnability to the advances of the blonde, and by his determination and toughness, Fenner is able to preserve himself in safety in the underworld, and it is he who discovers the treasure, although he fails to secure her. For, like Eurydice, she slips back into the darkness. Ma, likewise, is not personally given to any kind of licentiousness, but, apart from racketeering, she runs a nightclub in which every kind of luxurious dissipation is practiced. It is she, also, who brings about Miss Blandish's debauch by Slim. Now, in stories which we shall examine later, we shall find this theme of the estrangement and conflict between king and queen, or mother and father, recurring. In Rose Macaulay's The World My Wilderness, we shall find the couple playing exactly the same roles, the father representing conventional rectitude, while the mother personifies the amoral, orgiastic principles. But in Dickens' Great Expectations, the roles are reversed. We must, therefore, be on our guard against describing the roles of arbiter of rectitude and anti-moral rebellion to father and mother, respectively, as representatives of the male and female sexes. We have noted that the similarities in character between Ma and Blandish outweigh the differences. Confining ourselves, therefore, carefully to the deductions permitted by our material, we are entitled only to the following conclusions. First, that this couple, as man and woman, represent a pair of opposites which are capable of union. Secondly, that instead of being united by love, they are separated by hatred. Thirdly, that they are powerful and authoritative figures, in fact parents. But it seems probable that in the specific roles they play as leaders of the warring factions, they may be interchangeable. This point may perhaps be explained if we turn to the instinctual basis of the images. The Great Adult Unlike a foal, a lamb, or a duckling, an animal which, like the human baby, is born in a helpless condition, is under no necessity to identify its mother. The young animal does not have to follow the mother about. The mother either carries it with her or deposits it in a safe place and visits it in order to feed it. It is safe to assume that an instinct which is entirely valueless to a species will not be found to exist in, unless, of course, the loss of value is due to an artificial change of environment. It is therefore highly probable that the human mind is not equipped with any innate mechanism designed to identify any single being as mother, that is to say, as the protective, nourishment-providing center of youthful existence. By the time the child has grown sufficiently to get about on its own, its intelligence has developed to a stage which enables it to identify a number of beings as such, its mother among them. By then, of course, if she does happen to be the being who exclusively cares and provides for him, she will have to come to occupy a special place in his world, but only as one person among others. There is no justification for assuming any inherent tendency to make a mother projection as such in the way that the duckling and the foal do. We are, moreover, far too apt to assume that the artificial picture of the family consisting of mother, father, and children is something fundamental. Human beings have always lived in communities, and pre-human beings almost certainly in herds. The primitive household, moreover, is generally a large one, accommodating several generations. When the primitive human child was old enough to move independently, and hence to get into trouble, the relationship of greatest importance in preserving it from danger would be that to other members of the herd in general rather than to its two specific parents. It is therefore a fair conjecture that the child would be equipped with an innate instinctive impulse to imitate, follow, and obey any adult human being with whom it would tend to take refuge when afraid. This surmise seems to be supported by the actual behavior of young children who are extremely accommodating in the matter of attachment, being prepared to accept the ministrations and authority of almost anybody who approaches them in the right way. Unfamiliarity may for a moment arouse their mistrust, but they very soon habituate themselves and are often no more and no less attached to nurses, servants, aunts, and others with whom they are familiar than they are to their own parents. As a contrast to this, it should be observed how a lamb, which has wandered away from its mother, will, if frightened, run back to her across a whole field, 
passing numerous other ewes without a glance, or how the foals, in a herd of horses on the move, remain close to their own mothers. If this is a true picture of the human instinctual pattern in the matter, we may assume the existence of a single mental figure of a very indeterminate nature towards which the child would tend to manifest the reactions of seeking protection, imitation, and self-subordination. Such a figure would necessarily possess the quality of authority which would evoke the related feelings of trust and dread, submissive love and its converse rebelliousness. It would be experienced both as the terrible arbiter of rectitude in the incitement to sin as loving protector and stern judge. As to its external characteristics, it need only be human and large. Its sex, in particular, would be indeterminate. Here, evidently, we have something which might have served as the nucleus around which there crystallized the figure of the Semitic paternal deity and his counterpart, Satan, originally seen as two manifestations of a single essence. C.F. Dr. R. Scharf in Jung and Scharf, Symbolic des Geists. He is not, moreover, truly paternal, but rather parental, for the feminine element in the composition of Yahweh is revealed in the symbolism of the Ark and the Mercy Sea. Subsequently, it splits off in the independent figure of Wisdom, or Sophia, in the later Hebrew canonical scriptures, and of the Glory of the Lord, or Shekinah, of the Kabbalists, who is seen in female form. I shall call this figure the Great Adult. In my opinion, it provides the basis of all superordinated or authority deities who, as a class, are distinct from the deities based on other inherent images, such as those of the mating and other patterns to which humanity is predisposed. I must, however, make it clear that I do not for a moment advance this theory as an explanation of the nature of deity or divinity as such. To do so would be to adopt the typical superficial reductive attitude but to advance a theory designed to explain why human beings experience the principle of divinity in particular forms is no more an explanation of the ultimate nature of that principle than a theory concerning the mechanism of the eye and its effect on the images which we see is an explanation of the nature of light. We are concerned for the moment only with the nature of the human mind, which interprets the essence or principle in the form of images with particular attributes. A different constituted mind would form different images of the same essence or reality, just as an abnormal or differently constituted eye would do. When the figure of the great adult is brought to consciousness, it is necessarily split into pairs of opposites, and this dichotomy appears to tend to follow one of two planes of cleavage, that between male and female, and that between good and evil, or constituted authority and rebellion. The former produces the father and mother images, the latter those of God and the devil. The second of these dichotomies may produce a pair of deities of equal status, as in the Oromuzd and Ariman of the Zoroastrian system. These I shall call the upper and lower gods, both of whom may be seen as belonging to the same sex, in which form we shall meet with them later. The father and mother form of dichotomy involves the sexual images, which have basically nothing to do with the great adult. The resultant figures are therefore composite. Authority plus man, king, and authority plus woman, queen, respectively. As such, they give rise to mixed and unsuitable projections in which elements pertaining to the relationship between the sexes are entangled with others belonging to the relationship of authority. In the subsequent course of this study, we shall find examples of the troubles to which this confusion may lead. The theory, incidentally, involves an alternative explanation of those phenomena which the Freudians have interpreted as fixations on the figures of the personal father and mother. In No Orchids, both forms of dichotomy have taken place. Father and mother, or king and queen, figures have appeared and have been allotted arbitrarily to the opposing factions of the upper world, representing constituted authority, and of underworld representing rebellion. Dickens, as I have mentioned, made the opposite allocation. It is possible that personal factors play their part in the choice, but if so, they are accidentals and we need not trouble with them. 
for the time being, we must assume that father and mother are interchangeable. The terrible mother. The question still remains why Ma, whose prototype in Sanctuary is more of a humorous sketch than a vision of horror, should have been something so very repulsive, evil, and dangerous. The explanation is to be found, in part, in the nature of an archetypal figure to which Jung has drawn attention, giving it the name of Terrible Mother. Out of deference to the conventional attitude towards motherhood, she is more commonly seen in the role of the wicked stepmother, or even more closely disguised as a monster, dragon, or wild beast with which the hero must do battle. Jung has given a large number of examples in his Wandlungen und Symbole der Libido, English translation, The Psychology of the Unconscious, and others will appear in later chapters of this study, in which the significance of the figure will be further discussed. For the moment, we may regard her simply as the shadow side of the image of motherhood. The light side of the mother, the guise in which we like to see her, is that of a protective, lavishing, nourishing, wise, provident, guiding, and prolific principle. But this representation necessarily implies its opposite, the shadow side. This negative or dark aspect of motherhood derives from the awareness of individual separateness of the position of the living organism over against its non-individualized environment. Physical life represents a perpetual effort on the part of the individual organism to maintain itself in a state of differentiation from the great inorganic world. Let the effort once fail and the physical body loses its coherence. Its carefully regulated temperature equalizes itself with that of its surroundings. The complicated and unstable molecules of its chemical constitution break down into simpler forms. The law of entropy asserts itself and the few pounds of matter that had borne a living intelligence merge back into the millions of tons of unintelligent matter from which they were once drawn, dust to dust, ashes to ashes. It is precisely the same with mental life. Consciousness arises from the great undifferentiated mass of the collective unconscious. It burns more or less brightly for its allotted time, and finally decomposes into the materials from which it was drawn which return whence they came. Its maintenance is a perpetual effort from which we find relief in sleep and at last release in death. Thus the mother, from whose body we once drew the constituents of our own, stands for the great earth from which all living bodies are formed, and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Genesis 2, 7. She is also the great sea of the collective unconscious, in which the individual consciousnesses swim like fishes. To return to her is rest for the weary, but it implies also extinction for the spark of consciousness. In the last resort, the personal self is nothing but a coherent stream of consciousness, and what we fear in death is its termination. It can be nothing else. Therefore we also fear the mother, for she is the abyss and the darkness which comprehendeth not. In this respect, therefore, the mother is an object of fear, and in another she is an object of loathing. The blonde is an artificial synthesis of all the elements which are erotically pleasing in woman, and I have already indicated that such a selection leaves a number of other constituents of the inherent image of the opposite sex unaccounted for. These consist of those elements of the mating pattern which have no direct erotic value, and which, from the erotic point of view, are irksome and undesirable. These, being excluded from the conscious ideal, sink into the unconscious, where they tend to crystallize into a shadow image of womanhood, representing her as positive, exigent, tyrannical, parasitical, and so forth. Personal, objective experiences of women are similarly divided attractive elements being incorporated in the conscious ideal, while everything distasteful and repulsive is relegated to the unconscious, where it associates itself with the shadow image, thereby adding to it the images of the hideous old hag and other distasteful aspects of femininity. Ma Grissom, therefore, is the shadow side of the blonde, as repulsive as the latter is beguiling, 
as harsh and intractable as the blonde is amenable, as overbearing as she is submissive. We have seen how Chase, evidently with an uneasy feeling that the blonde in black pajamas lacked something of full femininity, experimented in the person of Anna with some of those less welcome characteristics which, as of course he knew, do occur in objective women. Anna is not entirely submissive. She has a temper, and she is not dissatisfied with endless sterile couplings with her lover. She begins to hanker for some more binding arrangement. But then the author begins to have misgivings, and has Eddie, and has Eddie ruthlessly reduce her to order. The most revealing episode, however, is that in which the blonde makes her brief appearance as a fat girl. Here, the writer, feeling that the unbroken succession of perfect figures was perhaps becoming unrealistic, not to say monotonous, has forced the blonde to accept a typical fe uh, feminine shortcoming, the tendency to run to fat. The consequence is startling, consisting in the sudden realization of Ma with her Tommy gun. Evidently, the insistence on the anti-erotic quality of fatness has activated the shadow image, and the fat girl is virtually transformed into Ma, thus revealing their underlying identity. Thus, it becomes apparent what the quest of the complete nature of the blonde entails. It is nothing less than the reconciliation with Ma Grissom. That means not only the acceptance of the less enjoyable, even the less edifying aspects of femininity, but a coming to terms with the whole collective unconscious, with all its terrors. Before leaving this figure, I wish to emphasize how easy it is to fall into error by presuming the existence of parallels between the inner and outer worlds, before it has been conclusively shown that they exist. It is clear that the complex figure of Ma Grissom contains an element of motherhood, and, proceeding from that point, it is all too easy to accept an explanation of all her characteristics on the basis of the particular characteristic relationship of the child to its mother in the outer world. But this relationship, as we have seen, has virtually no counterpart in the inner world, since the human child is almost certainly not equipped with any innate mother identification pattern. The characteristics of Ma derive partly from the relation of the conscious to the unconscious, partly from that of man to woman as mate, and partly from the innate tendency of subordination to authority. The element of motherhood occurs only in the first of these, and then only indirectly, in symbolical form. Deadlock and Release the latent conflict between the opposites personified in Blandish and Ma, which cast its shadow over the opening scene, amounts to a mental deadlock. The position, already indicated, is that the conscious attitude represented by Blandish and the principle of constituted authority is obstinately refusing to allow the assimilation into the conscious mind and personality of a whole category of experience. The explanation of the nature of this discrimination must be left till later. For the moment, we must be content with indicating that in the present case it is connected with the feeling life. That is why the courtship, matrimonial, and parental elements of the mating pattern are unacceptable. They are matters of feeling relationship as opposed to erotic attraction. Jung, on the basis of clinical experience, tells us that this situation is the essential cause of neurosis. It derives from the fact that the conscious attitude, which, as we know, is itself unconscious until the attention of the conscious mind has been drawn to it by an outside agency, has built up a set of prejudices against certain categories of experiences and functions which are inherent in the mind. These it sincerely regards as inferior, unreliable, misleading, dangerous, and repulsive, at best trivial and foolish, and at worst definitely evil. Consequently, it rejects this type of experience, flees from it, combats it, and attempts to suppress it altogether. But its efforts are worse than useless, for the functions and modes of experience in question are as much an integral and inherent part of the mind as the digestive system is of the body. It is impossible to eliminate them, and the attempt to do so only arouses inner resistance. In a serviceable analogy which must not be taken as a scientific statement, 
we may say that this attitude provokes the elements discriminated against to hostile activities. These may take the form of obsessions, compulsions, and similar neurotic symptoms, or simply of devitalization, depression, and general misery. When this situation obtains, Jung shows that the conscious mind is not only helpless, but that its attempts to deal with the condition can only aggravate it. Every conscious effort implies an intensification of the repressive conscious attitude, and hence an added provocation of the repressed elements, which react with increased hostility. The action of the conscious mind is essentially discriminative, and therefore the more the problems in question are revolved in consciousness, the more widely are the opposites sundered and the greater grows the tension between them. The possibility of reconciliation grows more remoter than ever. In these circumstances, a solution can only be provided by the unconscious mind, and Jung has found from practical experience that it does offer suggestions which, if accepted by the conscious mind and followed in practice, do in fact cure the condition. He has named this mode of activity of the mind the transcendental function, because it transcends the strife of the opposites and thereby brings about reconciliation and the restoration of the lost unity of the personality. Its working may be visualized as a direct intervention by that center of being, which must of necessity remain intact for as long as individual life lasts. The schism between the opposing and sundered halves of the personality may go very deep, but if it is followed downwards far enough, the point of union in the center must at last be reached, and from this point it is possible to take a truly impartial view of the conflict which does justice to both sides, and from which it is therefore possible to formulate a solution which satisfies both of them. The solution, however, is not produced by the conscious mind, except in so far as it makes itself receptive to it by establishing contact with the center. The center lies, so to speak, in the innermost recesses of the unconscious. It cannot itself by any possibility become conscious, since its essence, being absolute unity, precludes the differentiating function which is the essence of consciousness. It is that regarded by which we can predicate nothing, and which is therefore always inaccessible to our thought. This matter will be considered in closer detail later. The solution emanating from the center, therefore, always appears to consciousness as coming from outside itself. It may be in the form of an inner image appearing in a dream, vision, or fantasy, or which simply writes itself into a story or other work, or it may appear in the form of a projection onto an outer object, which suddenly acquires significance of an unexpected kind. But whatever the form of its appearance, it is certain to give the impression of something new and unfamiliar, or something demanding a fresh approach, hitherto untried for its very essence is change. In consequence, it will evoke an initial mistrust. The conscious mind will at first be reluctant to accept it, but everything depends on its finding the insight and adaptability to overcome this reluctance. Frequently, the new departure demanded of the conscious mind takes the form of the acceptance of something hitherto despised or feared, and of this we shall find numerous examples. Maud Bodkin, in her Archetypal Patterns in Poetry, draws attention to the exposition of this situation in Coleridge's Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. The mariner, having committed the crime of shooting the albatross, is becalmed. He has, in fact, reached the condition of deadlock and is stuck fast. In this situation, he is in danger of dying of thirst, as his shipmates, in fact, do. In other words, he is cut off from the waters of life, an old and fundamental symbol of the life-giving powers of the unconscious with which we shall meet again. Attention has already been drawn to the condition of being parched and exhausted in connection with the opening scene of no orchids, and the theme is the same as that of Demeter's denial of vegetation to the world during her daughter's absence. It occurs again in slightly different form in Wagner's Ring of the Nibelungs, which will be considered in a later volume. 
As the mariner suffers the torments of thirst among his dead companions, he sees loathsome creatures in the sea, from which he averts his eyes in disgust. And a thousand thousand slimy things lived on, and so did I. I looked upon the rotting sea and drew my eyes away. Then the moon rises, and he is overcome with a sudden love for the creatures of the sea. O happy living things, no tongue their beauty might declare. A spring of love gushed in my heart, and I blessed them unaware. Sure, my kind saint took pity on me, and I blessed them unaware. After this reconciliation, he finds himself unable to pray again, the shameful corpse of the albatross. After this reconciliation, he finds himself unable to pray again, the shameful corpse of the albatross, which had been hung about his neck, falls off into the sea and he sinks into a deep sleep. This symbolism of carrying an animal or corpse, etc., is cited by Jung as representing the transitus, or difficult passage, between two stages of mental development. It is to be found also in the medieval romances, in which knights are frequently condemned to carry the head of a person shamefully slain about their necks, until it falls off on its own accord. An instance is also to be found in the Arabian Nights, in the image of the old man of the sea, whom Sindbad cannot remove from his shoulders, until at last he falls off when drunk. While he sleeps, it rains, and he is refreshed. Then the wind springs up, and the ship moves once more. Maud Bodkin, in a detailed analysis of the emotional effect of the various passages, states that several readers of the poem have confirmed her own impression that the atmosphere of hopelessness and depression which pervades the account of the calming is suddenly lifted by the line which tells of the moon's rising. It is, in fact, the appearance of the feminine principle, in her pure and celestial form, which breaks the deadlock. Coleridge, in his marginal notes, places this matter beyond doubt. These are the relevant items. The mariner despiseth the creatures of the calm, and envieth that they should live, and so many lie dead. In his loneliness and fixedness, i.e. the deadlock, he yearneth toward the journeying moon. By the light of the moon he beholdeth God's creatures of the great calm, their beauty and their happiness. He blesseth them in his heart. The spell begins to break. By the grace of the Holy Mother, the ancient mariner is refreshed with rain. Here, evidently, we have a complete account of deadlock broken by the love and acceptance of something hitherto despised and rejected. And it is the Holy Mother who reveals to him the unsuspected virtue, grants him the power to love and to pray, and at last restores him the waters of life and the ability to move onwards. No orchids is a very different story, and yet, as we have seen, it is the appearance of Miss Blandish which brings new life to the situation and transforms the trivial tale of a jewel robbery into the fantastic epic of the rape of Persephone, or Helen, and the siege of the Paradise Club. Her relationship to the Holy Mother will shortly become apparent.